become increasingly unpopular, particularly in the West Bank and Gaza Strip, because Palestinians feel that the U.S. government has sided with Israel. One man, a Nawal Abdel Fattah, wearing a long black dress, threw sweets in the air, saying, actually that's a woman, pardon me, saying she was happy because, quote, America is the head of the snake. America always stands by Israel in its war against us. Meanwhile, Yasser Arafat emerged to speak with reporters ahead of the Palestinian Liberation Organization. He said, we are completely shocked. It's unbelievable. Unbelievable. We completely condemn this very dangerous attack, and I convey my condolences to the American people, to the American president, and to the American administration, not only in my name, but on behalf of the Palestinian people. And this comes on a day, Katie, in which uh, obviously there's been a steady deterioration of the situation in the Middle East, but uh, Shimon Perez was to meet today with Yasser Arafat in the West Bank. Uh, the, uh, there has been some criticism of the Bush administration for not getting more involved in the peacemaking efforts in the Middle East uh, in, the, in the past few weeks uh, from within the Republican Party as well. Because it's, it has gotten increasingly volatile. It has. It, there's been a steady escalation of violence, uh, incursions by Israelis into Palestinian towns and declaring martial law and then pulling back. Uh, and everyone thought that, uh, that, the, that the bomb was ticking in the Middle East. No one expected anything of these kinds of consequences to be visited upon this country in this horrific way, way that we have been witness to today. It is one more example, as we have been saying this morning, of events in far off places that have such an enormous impact here because the United States is in the eyes of so many people who uh, who are opposed to our system of government and uh, our alliances is the devil incarnate. And uh, today, this is a very sophisticated, very cold-blooded, very widespread attack carried out with uh, the most chilling kind of efficiency on several of the great nerve centers of our system of government and our way of life. And we're talking about perhaps thousands of casualties. What's one thing that's very frustrating about reporting this story is we know that many, many people were inevitably very seriously hurt or killed in these explosions. We have four aircraft uh, full of people, uh, obviously, that were involved in these incidents and an untold number of people who were in the World Trade Center at the time, in the surrounding area, and of course those individuals at the Pentagon as well. And you can and, and only hope that, that in the time between the actual collision, the planes hitting the towers, and the time it took for those buildings to collapse, that, that large numbers of people were able to get down the stairs, you'd have to assume that power in the building was probably disrupted. Elevators may not have been usable, that they were able to get down smoke-filled stairways to safety before both of those towers collapsed. And as Pat Dawson just said, though, from the 60th floor up, it was very, very, very difficult. And uh, there are 110 floors in the Twin each. Towers each in the World Trade Center. So you obviously, you're talking about 50 floors, if his estimate is correct of people. Now the first explosion did occur at 8.42 in the morning. Uh, some people might not have been at work yet, but many people here in New York, a workaholic town, get to work early, particularly those who are watching the markets, the overseas markets, and this is the financial center of the United States and of course of New York City as well. Yeah, we have hesitated to use specific numbers, but uh, Mary Giuliani is saying it's a horrendous number of lives lost and it could be in the thousands. We want to go now to Ray Kelly, who's a former police commissioner here in New York. We are going to now cut into the network coverage to bring you back here to New York City to tell you new information that we may have about the situation here. I'm Jane Hansen with Jim Rosenfield. And good uh, day to you all. We want to go right to Tiwa Chang, who is standing by, we are told, with Mayor Giuliani, who can give us the latest information on casualties, what we know about anyone who uh, may have perished in this act of terrorism as it's being called. Tiwa, are you there? Yes, Jim, I'm here. I'm at, I, ha I cannot tell you where I am because for security reasons, the mayor's office and the police department have moved the emergency center away from lower Manhattan, uh, evacuating the police headquarters to a degree, and this, they also left the emergency bunker, which is the seven World Trade Center right next to where the two twin towers were. Uh, I talked to the mayor directly. I rode up with his motorcade, and he said, when I asked him about the four planes that were in the air, the possible 
uh, possibly filled with bombs or whatever may be the case. He said, that's not a problem. That has been taken care of. I don't know what he meant by that, but he said that is not a concern now. I also ran into the fire commission, Mr. Von Essen, Thomas Von Essen. I asked him how many casualties were there. He said, I know many, many firemen and police officers were in those buildings when they went down. I do not know the extent. At this point, uh, it's believed to me many, many hundreds, at least if not thousands of people perished. That's not confirmed. Every official I've asked, can you give me a number, says they cannot give me a number. One, because the number is so staggering, but also because they, at this point they're not really sure. All they know is there were many, many uh, people inside those buildings, especially firemen and policemen inside those buildings. We are now at a secret location. They've asked all of us not to broadcast it because they are now regrouping here to try and determine what to do to see if there's uh, any possible further attacks at this point and how to triage people and take care of the emergency management at this point. Uh, can't tell you where I am, but I, I am in the city somewhere, and th that is actually the latest that I got just about five minutes ago from both the mayor and the fire commissioner. Now back to uh, Jane and Jim in the studio. Tiwa, what, what, what is the mayor saying about, we, we've got a city that's a little panicky at the moment. We have an awful lot of people who are either stuck in town, they can't get home from their office buildings, um, there, are very, there are virtually no modes of transportation. I've been told that they're shutting off power to some buildings in lower Manhattan now. Um, what what can he right. say to these people to help them well, Jane, as they try to, to you, sort? Uh, Jane, I walked from my apartment on the west side all the way downtown, and I have to tell you that the people are calm. This reminds me very much of when I was in Beirut in a war situation. Uh, people are out walking on the street, walking away. Most people walking away from downtown Manhattan, walking north, uptown, but very calmly. A lot of people standing by uh, uh, radios because of the uh, and televisions and stores. Uh, some of the store people, it reminds me of the blackout situation where we've had a lot of calm and people pulling together. I have not seen any panic. On the, I walked all the way downtown. Uh, now, obviously, in Lower Manhattan, where the explosion occurred, there probably re I'm sure there was. But uh, as far as the people leaving the area, it's very calm. And, uh, and people are listening uh, by cars that have their radios on. Stores have their televisions on. There's a sense of unity of people and also just a sickening feeling at what has happened in the sense that this, you know, can't imagine that this would happen. But it's so far from what I've seen, from walking down, I walked down 9th Avenue and 7th Avenue and 6th Avenue, it was very calm the whole way down there. In terms of what will happen after this, uh, that's what they're working toward, and they seem to feel the main concern now is the number of people who are injured, trying to get them to hospitals, and also the many, many people, scores of people who have been killed in, in this clearly what appears to be a, a terrorist attack, but that's not even confirmed yet at this point. So, Tiwa, in a word, uh, as far as any kind of specific advice from Mayor Giuliani as to what New Yorkers and commuters who have come to New York today to carry out their business... Hang on one second, Jim. Yes. We are listening to Tiwa Chang, who is with yeah. the mayor and... Okay, the, the, what the mayor said in the news conference, okay, because I rode up uh, with the, the caravan. Mm -hmm. he's, I spoke to him directly. I only asked him about the planes, and I asked the fire commissioner about the number of injured and, and killed. The mayor has said in his news conference he's asking people to remain calm. I have to tell you, from what I've seen, certainly in lower Manhattan, walking toward the, the bomb sites... Uh, and that's what they have to be called at this point, I would assume, is, is that there's a lot of calm, people working together, stores giving out uh, uh, water, uh, televisions on, people trying to get the news of what has happened, people talking to each other, a few people walking down toward downtown to try and reach their children at the schools and also at the, uh, at the uh, borough of Manhattan Community College, which is also near the, the bomb site on, uh, on West Street. But uh, the mayor did ask for everyone to basically stay calm, probably stay at home and to certainly stay away from Manhattan today if you're in any of the outer boroughs. All right. Thank you, Tiwa. Obviously, we will come back to you as the, as the management of this city regroups and tries to figure out what their next step should be. Okay. Uh, we have this to report to you that apparently United Airlines has confirmed or has said that another of its airliners is crashing quote unquote. Um, we have not confirmed where which airline that was, but there was some talk earlier that it was a Boston to Los Angeles airplane that they weren't sure where it was. So we don't know if that's that airplane or not, um, but there apparently has been a, a, another crash of an airline.
uh, involving a United Airlines airliner. We'll get you that information just as soon as we get any details on that. And in the meantime, Brian Thompson is standing by live for us right now at Newark Airport, one of the three major airports shut down at this Here at hour. Newark Airport, this was one of the first airports to shut down nationwide. One of the reasons is one of the planes that came out of Newark Airport, or United Flight uh, number 93, uh, was flying from Newark to San Francisco, and that was hijacked as well. You may have heard that by now into Pittsburgh, where it was crashed in Pittsburgh. Uh, we don't have, of course, the full listing of planes and airports, but the situation you see behind me is an indication of security nationwide at all airports here. The Port Authority have blocked off the entrance to the air traffic control tower, the administration building, and to their police headquarters. Officers armed with shotguns and sniper rifles, AR-15s, according to the police here. You see that site all over the airport as well. Now I'm going to ask my photographer, Jim Roberts, to take you to the site that uh, has just devastated the New York metropolitan area. Over the tails of parked Continental Express Airlines, because this airport is shut down and for the most part evacuated now, you can see what remains of the World Trade Center in Lower Manhattan. About three hours ago, you would have seen the two twin towers sticking above the tails. Now all you see is the terrible smoke that's coming from that scene as everybody wonders why all of this happened at this point. I'm going to ask my technician, uh, Robert Gonzalez, to roll some tape of the airport itself that we took a few minutes ago. Excuse the uh, bump in the video here, but uh, this is what it looked like about an hour ago here at Newark Airport as people were told no flights were going out anymore. They had to turn around, go to their homes, go to hotels, go to wherever, find rental cars. Thousands of people at this airport, the busiest airport in the New York metropolitan area, with nothing but uh, an extremely trying day ahead of them, lining up, waiting for cabs, limos. Some people were actually walking over to the rental car areas that we talked to, and nobody understanding how this could happen, why this could happen, and you, the Brian, magnitude of what had happened. We must leave you at this moment because Governor Pataki apparently is speaking now, and he is on NBC. And let's go take this live. Ability had been eliminated through security measures. I mean, obviously no one can predict an airliner or two airliners crashing into these buildings, but was there some sense that, that security had been shored up? You, you know, you do everything you can. You, you make sure that people don't get into the towers without being inspected. You make sure that people can't park under the towers, uh, but you just can't be prepared for a plane to fly into one of the towers or two planes to fly into the towers. It's a horrible, horrible situation. Uh, our heart goes out to all those whose families are uh, at risk, and we're just going to do everything we can to respond and be uh, supportive and helpful to uh, them. Obviously, the loss of life is the primary concern right now in helping those who've been injured, but uh, if you will, at least talk to me a little bit about the, the other impact of, of this building. This is, for, for example, as Tom and, and Katie and I have pointed out, the world financial, financial center, the hub of finances in the world, if not at least here in the United States. What type of, of damage has, has been done to the financial infrastructure of this country? Uh, the economic impact is something we can talk about as the days unfold. Right now, we still have to focus on making sure we save as many people as possible, help those who are injured, help with an orderly removal of the people who are leaving downtown and leaving the city, we're going to focus on that and be concerned about what may or may not be the economic consequences once the immediate crisis has passed. All right. Do you have plans to get down to this area? Yes, in I'm in the city, and uh, I've been in touch with the mayor, and we're going to be continuing to do everything we can. Governor, what about uh, other emergency procedures for the city of New York uh, in the next several days in terms of what's going to remain shut down and so on? A lot of people have this as a destination. A lot of people, millions well, Tom, of people have here. Uh, Tom, right now we do have limited service out of the city. We have both the Metro North and Long Island Railroad running out. We have the George Washington Bridge open. Uh, the tunnels are shut for security reasons. We're not having traffic other than emergency traffic come into the city. Uh, and I think at this point it would be extremely unlikely that we're going to have many people coming into the city tomorrow. We're going to be continuing to try to deal with the horrendous situation downtown. All Thank right. you very much, Governor. I know it's been a long and difficult day, and it will go on uh, for you and for all New Yorkers for a long, long time, unfortunately. Well, our prayers are with the, the families and the people whose lives are still at risk. Thanks, Thank you Governor. very much, Governor. Thank you. We want to go now, Matt, to uh, Jim Mikloszewski, who is at the Pentagon. Jim, a lot of these flights were transcontinental flights, uh, heavily loaded not only with passengers but with fuel. 
Uh, that's right, Tom. And uh, we just learned a few m moments ago that uh, the U.S. Navy is dispatching a couple of aircraft carriers from Norfolk, uh, the JFK and the George Washington. Uh, one will be stationed off of New York. Uh, the other will be stationed in the Atlantic as close to Washington, D.C. as they can get. Uh, they'll be there to provide any possible military support that may be needed, including flying any kind of air cover uh, should there be any additional warnings of any further terrorist uh, attempted attacks. Uh, now, as we stood here this morning, you can see the smoke is still billowing. The smoke just in the past few minutes has changed from black to white, a strong indication that they're throwing more water on the fire, as we saw from other uh, vantage points. Uh, but the priority now is to get the fire under control. Uh, a casualty count is impossible at this point, Tom. As you've seen from the earlier pictures, the plane opened a huge wide gash in the side of the building. Uh, we're being told between the fourth and the fifth corridors. It, it smashed through the E and D rings, and people who were in that area tell me that debris and parts of the plane actually penetrated deep all the way into the B ring. There are five rings, A through E, and it entered in the E ring, so it plowed through a number of the rings. Uh, the priority now, as I said, is, is accounting for uh, the casualties. Uh, medevac helicopters have been flying in and out. You hear the ambulances. Occasionally, we've even seen F-16s flying low uh, routes around the Pentagon and over Washington, D.C., flying those CAPS or, or uh, air patrol missions uh, uh, that are usually flown in combat. But to see two aircraft carriers moved in locations off the United States to provide air cover, Tom, uh, I mean, that's the kind of thing you normally see in a war zone. Uh, Mick, uh, can you tell me, uh, was that a chosen randomly where they hit uh, the Pentagon? Can you tell us what the, what the function of those people in that particular ring was, where, they were, where it was hit? Well, it's interesting because uh, uh, a number of people, uh, and it, this really wasn't sarcastic, but they said, well, they hit on the wrong side because just the opposite side of the building, of course, you have uh, the offices of the Joint Chiefs of Staff and, uh, and the Secretary of Defense, Donald Rumsfeld. We were on that side of the building when the plane hit. Uh, we felt the building shake, the, the windows rattle, and looking outside immediately saw people on the run. There was pandemonium in the hallways. Now that section uh, of the Pentagon, uh, I thought at first uh, when it was described to me uh, that it may have hit in an area where some of the special operations offices are located. Uh, uh, the assistant secretary for special operations is located near there, but the plane actually hit maybe about uh, 60 to 70 feet to the right of that location. In that part of the building, there's uh, uh, it's very near a mall area, actually, where they have uh, a shopping area uh, for Pentagon employees. After all, there are 25 to 30,000 employees in there on any given day. Uh, and also in that part of the building, you had many Navy personnel, many reserve personnel. Uh, I bumped into many Army personnel who are adjacent to that. Uh, they think everybody's all right. The Navy people I talked to said they still had a few people that were unaccounted for. But again, it's going to be impossible to tell exactly what the casualty count is in there until they get that fire under control. Matt. All right. Jim Mikoshevsky outside the Pentagon. Thanks very much. Joining okay. us now is General Norman Schwarzkopf who was the commander of all forces in the Persian Gulf War. General Schwarzkopf, good morning to you. Good morning. Obviously, you've seen the footage, I'm sure, of the Pentagon and, and of southern Manhattan. Uh, we haven't seen much footage outside Pittsburgh. What are your thoughts this morning? Well, you know, it's a, it's a very, very sad day for this country. It's really a sad day for the world, as far as I'm concerned. And your heart goes out to all those families, and your prayers go out to all those people who lost their lives. We, we are fighting a war now, it seems, uh, a terrorist war here in this country. The question is, how do we go about fighting it, General? Well, you know, that's, a, that's, that's, that's one of those easy questions to ask and one of those very tough questions to answer. Uh, the, the deterrence against terrorists is, is almost impossible because uh, these are people who could care less about their own survival. And normally deterrence uh, is, is just says, you know, you hit me and we hit you back. Uh, harder and in this case uh, these people don't care whether they lose their lives or not and therefore it makes it doubly tough to to deter the fact is that the world is getting smaller and 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 you know terrorism has come to our shores because we have uh, the ability to span oceans and great distances in very short time you know, general have you been able to talk to anyone at the pentagon and and get some updates on on who may have been injured or, or lost 
No, I mean, the information that, that I've heard is basically what you all have, and that's that's it. You know, they didn't hit the very critical parts, and, and therefore maybe we don't have as many casualties there. But when you look at what happened at the World Trade Center and the number of casualties that they probably have there, it's just, it's just horrendous. General Schwarzkopf, hi, it's Katie. I, I'm just wondering, I mean, obviously you've been in the military for a long, long time. Have you ever heard, or is this a, a method of destruction that the U.S. military was aware of and had concerns about, where they would actually, hijackers would use a plane as a flying bomb? Well, Katie, you know, Tom Clancy wrote a book about just that. Uh, several years ago, he wrote a book about a Japanese pilot uh, crashing his 747 directly into the Capitol building and wiping out the national government. And uh, so it's not something that's new. Uh, obviously, what's kind of shocking is we thought we had good good protection against hijacking of aircraft. And, and what's very apparent today is that something needs to be done about that if this many aircraft can be hijacked Me all meaning at the same time. Meaning security also, at airports across the country, General? Well, uh, well, I, I, that and many other measures I, that, that, that could be taken. But, I mean, it's, it's kind of frightening when you consider the number of aircraft that were simultaneously hijacked and apparently with, I don't know, I can't say with apparent ease, I don't know, but it did, in fact, happen. And that, that's kind of frightening in itself. Well, the also General Tom Brokaw here, the uh, the failure of intelligence here. I know it's always since getting inside a terrorist group uh, is probably the most difficult type of, of uh, penetration that you can do. I mean, you've got to have somebody on the inside uh, that can let you know what's going on, and that's not always the easiest thing to do in this type of uh, uh, terrorist organization. All right, thank you very much, General Norman Schwarzkopf. We uh, will be back in touch with you throughout the day as we get more information. We'd love to get your oversight on all of this if we can. Okay. Well, let's go to uh, Paul Bremer now, Ambassador Paul Bremer, who is the Chairman of the National Commission on Terrorism. Uh, Mr. Ambassador, do we have any idea whatsoever who may be responsible for this? Well, as you were just saying, we have a massive intelligence failure and a huge security failure that are going to have to be looked into. Analytically, there probably are four possible candidates. There's the Osama bin Laden Al-Qaeda group that you've been talking about. There is the possibility of a Middle Eastern group such as Hezbollah or the Palestinian Islamic Jihad conducting an attack like this. And there are at least two states which at least are capable of such an attack, and that would be Iran and Iraq. So you have probably not more than four suspects. Uh, how do we begin to find out who is responsible? Well, the good news is that the uh, uh, hijacking four airplanes is a very complicated operation. Even hijacking one is complicated. And they will have left some trail behind them. They will have had to have checked in. They will have had to have purchased tickets either under their name or alias names. They will have had to have show pieces of identity. There will be a trail that will lead back from the hijackers at some point to the perpetrators. It may take some time, uh, but we'll get there. You're an expert on national security matters, uh, Ambassador. How is this country going to have to change? Well, I think it's one of those great challenges of fighting terrorism is to find the balance between being tempted to overreact, but also being absolutely certain, as the President said this morning, that people understand we're not going to take this sitting down. And I think once the perpetrators have been identified, and I believe they will be, uh, the United States will have to retaliate with the full force of its military as hard as it possibly can. This is an act of war. It's an act of war that some have described as a domestic Pearl Harbor. In, in many ways, it's worse than Pearl Harbor. I think we will probably find the casualties are going to be higher than they were at Pearl Harbor. In Pearl Harbor, we knew immediately who had done it, and we therefore knew what the return address was. It was Japan. Here, we have higher casualties, less certainty as to where the attack came from, and therefore a, a more difficult response. But there must be a very strong military response to this act of war. Thank you very much, Ambassador Paul Bremer, who is a longtime colleague of Henry Kissinger and a veteran of national security affairs in this country. Uh, it, this is a uh, routine in times like this. The Taliban ambassador to Pakistan has condemned what he called the terrorist attack, saying this is a terrorist act we strongly condemn as the Taliban have given shelter to the Saudi mil militant Osama bin Laden, of course, and he, he's been accused by the United States in the past of masterminding these kinds of attacks. So they're at least on the record uh, from a rhetorical point of view of saying we had nothing to do with this. Let's go to Martin Fletcher, NBC's Martin Fletcher, Tom, who is in Israel. 
uh, right now. Martin, tell me uh, the reaction uh, by the Israelis to this course turn of events here in the United States. Well, of course, everybody has been very, very quick to, uh, to express complete solidarity with the, with the United States. The Israelis, of course, are very experienced in these kind of things. They've offered to send all their emergency help they can to the United States. Uh, they've also, by the way, just closed the Israeli airspace just in case uh, things do spread. But the, among the Palestinians, uh, a different reaction. Yasser Arafat immediately expressed complete horror, condemned the attacks completely. But on the same time, in some places on the streets, in the Palestinian towns, there's been a, a rather strong expressions of support, of, of delight even. There are 3,000 Palestinians took to the streets, we're told, in the West Bank city of Nablus, and smaller demonstrations also in East Jerusalem, Tulkam, uh, Bethlehem, other Palestinian towns, in support of the bombers, uh, happy of the, these few Palestinians at what has happened. But of course, that's just... We don't know how widespread that is, but there have been some clear support, uh, demonstrations of yeah. support for the bombings. But Martin, we should point but out... But I must stress, the Palestinian leader... I should stress that Palestinian leaders all condemn totally the bombings. We should put into some perspective for us, if you could, Martin, how uh, displeased many Palestinians are with the United States right now about their feelings that somehow the U.S. is siding more with, Israeli and, and what's going, with the Israelis in terms of what's going on in the Middle East. Well, there's <coughs> complete support across the board uh, belief among Palestinians that the United States and Israel are one, that, that the United States is together with Israel uh, in, in, the, um, in, in the situation here in, in, the, uh, in Israel and the West Bank. They believe the United States completely supports Israel and therefore uh, deserves to be to some kind of um, attacks against the United States. So there have been many calls here. Uh, especially in recent weeks, by the way, in, in some of the Palestinian media, for attacks against the United States. So there is a, a great feeling of anger, a great belief that America supports Israel, and a great belief also that Israel, without American support, could not be uh, as aggressive in its retaliation against Palestinian suicide attacks as it is. So but Martin, that, that's a, a really... A feeling, strong feeling... I was just going to say, Martin, that, that sentiment... Sorry, Katie, that, I was just going to say, that sentiment is really nothing new. Has it been exacerbated? in recent weeks uh, in terms of how the Bush administration has been dealing with the Mideast? I think it has been exacerbated because throughout the, throughout the last 11 months of the, of, the, of the fighting, there was always a feeling among Palestinian leaders that the worse the fighting got, the more likely it would be that the United States administration would intervene uh, would try to, imp to help impose a, solu a solution on the Palestinians and the Israelis. The Palestinians have always wanted an international force to get involved, believing that would, that's the only way to really get to a solution, an imposed solution. And what they're seeing from Washington uh, is, if, if anything, President Bush backtracking from that, it, it, making it rather clear in several statements from American leaders that Israel and the, and the Palestinians should get on with it, and that until there's a real possibility of peace talks, America won't get involved. That's the belief of Palestinians. But of course, I just want to stress that this Palestinian anger, we don't know that has anything to do, of course, with what happened today. All right. Thank you, Martin Fletcher, in Israel this morning, this we have afternoon. Some, I was going to say we have a couple of other developments that we ought to share with everyone. Uh, as uh, it ripple effect seems like an understatement. Uh, the U.S. borders with Mexico and Canada now have been closed. White House sources are saying all principals in the White House, uh, senior Bush advisors and officials like the Vice President and the President himself are either in the Situation Room or in bomb shelters. They will not say exactly where the President is except to say that he is safe. Um, there, there have been comparisons to Pearl Harbor this morning. 2,400 people were killed in Pearl Harbor on that attack on December 7, 1941. It is likely that the death toll today will be higher. The political magnitude of this is yet to be fully calibrated as well. But as we have been saying throughout the day, this is a new form of warfare against the United States. And as Ambassador Bremer said, in that case, we had the return address. Right. It's, it's still certainly unclear and may remain unclear who was responsible for these absolutely horrendous attacks. Christian Martin is a producer for Dateline NBC and he joins us now. And good afternoon once again everyone. I'm Jim Rosenfield along with Jane Hansen. We are sort of working in tandem with NBC News. We want to bring you the very latest in local information that might be of importance to our local viewers. And we have just heard from Mayor Giuliani a short time ago. Let's listen in to what he had to say. Go north. For two reasons, the dangerous smoke condition, and secondly, we need all of the open space we can get to evacuate people from the World Trade Center. What we've heard is, I think, what you've heard, which is that there are two 
different planes hit the two towers of the World Trade Center. There was an attack of some kind on the Pentagon, which was confirmed to me by the White House. The, the Defense Department, and I don't know, I don't, I don't believe so. The Pentagon is what I was told. The uh, military has sealed, or, or is trying to seal the airspace around New York City. I assume they're doing the same thing with Washington. We know, because we've seen several jets up there, American jets up there. We have our helicopters up in the air also. So we hope right now that things are stable, but the evacuation effort from lower Manhattan is going to be horrendous. And uh, it's uh, probably the most horrifying thing I've ever seen in my whole life watching people jump from that building. That was Mayor Giuliani within the past hour, mm -hmm. and his advice right at the top of that sound was go north. Exactly, which is the best thing to do. We've had a number of inquiries into our offices about where people can get information, emergency information, uh, information about people who might have been in those two buildings, um, information about transit, etc. You can go to our website. We have dozens of phone numbers that are at WNBC.com. And please go there because that way you can get the accurate information and the numbers which will... Uh, give you all that you need to know for the moment, at least what there is to know, because again, uh, there continues to be a lot of information that we are seeking and we do not have answers to. And, and in fact, we have heard of, uh, of a few casualties, but we do not yet know the extent of um, the, the human casualties in, in today's uh, tragic incidents. And the scope of this, what appears to be very well-coordinated terrorist attack, is unfathomable. And Ralph Penz is in our newsroom right now to share with us uh, what you have learned in the way of the terrorism angle on this story, Ralph. Yes, folks, you've been hearing some speculation this morning, but now an FBI source that has been very reliable in the past for me tells me that the Bureau is now convinced that this has all the marks of the multi-millionaire terrorist Osama bin Laden. Only someone with his widespread terrorist operations, I'm told and I'm quoting, could have pulled off such an elaborate attack. And shortly after I talked with the FBI source, other experts began pointing to bin Laden. Now, you should know that just a few weeks ago, he was saying that he would spring an unprecedented attack on the United States. And as we're talking, unless things have changed, he has been under the protection of the government, so-called, in Afghanistan. And Afghanistan has been warned by the United States in the past that if bin Laden pulled anything of this magnitude, uh, they would face a great deal of difficulty from the United States and perhaps military action. And so we're going to have to see now what takes place. And as you look at these horrific scenes, you can only wonder what the uh, U.S. military and the FBI is now planning. But I can tell you the FBI is now convinced that Osama bin Laden is at the heart of this. Back to you. As I look at this list, there were two American Airlines air airplanes that were involved. There were two United flights. Um, it, it's possible that the second United flight was the original crash into the North Tower of the World Trade Center. That's the, the speculation that I'm, that I'm hearing now. So it appears to have hijacked these airplanes is what we're looking at at the moment, according to uh, some, of, some of your FBI sources. Right. Uh, there, would be, there would be a track record of some sort, at least names, at least somebody had to be on board that airplane to hijack it. So that will give them some kind of leads, will it not? Well. You know they're working already, and uh, my uh, instinct on this is that the, the force of the statement indicates they've already got some indication of where they're going. Incidentally, we're getting some uh, other late developments locally here. You may, you may have already reported them, I'm not sure, but just to be sure, the uh, northern and western borders of this state, of New York State, have now been completely closed. Uh, the U.S., of course, is now closing the borders uh, with Mexico and with Canada. Just, uh, just came across the desk. I thought I'd pass that on to you. Thank you, Ralph. We appreciate right, that. Jane. Uh, we should also tell you that Con Ed has reported some outages that apparently in Lower Manhattan, West Street, and to the and Hudson River, south of Chamber Street. Apparently, there's also some gas and steam service that has been interrupted. So, um, again, at all of our urgings are simply avoid going towards downtown Manhattan at all costs today. And, and I'm sitting here holding uh, faxes that have been coming into the newsroom. We'll just pass them on to you with information about closings. The Metropolitan Museum of Art closed to the public this morning. The Yankee game has been canceled in light of this morning's event. In fact, Major League Baseball has pwned its entire schedule for right. today across the country. All branches, all 85 branches and four research libraries of the New York Public Library closed today. 
Uh, you mentioned the Con Ed power problems. New Jersey, this is important. New York Waterway Ferry Service operating to New Jersey. It is carrying passengers from Manhattan over to the New Jersey side. Ferries are departing Pier 11 at the foot of Wall Street to points in Jersey City, Hoboken, and Weehawken. They're telling us that additional boats are departing from the New York Waterway Ferry Terminal at West 38th Street to Weehawken. So that is indeed a way for people to get out of Manhattan. It might be one of your only ways at the moment. Right. I do have some bridge and tunnel information as well. The Lincoln Tunnel still shut down. The Holland Tunnel still shut down. Uh, we had heard from Governor Pataki earlier on the network. He was saying that portions of the GW Bridge uh, were reopened to outbound traffic as well as LIRR trains and Metro North trains heading outbound, heading out of the city, although the Verrazano and Brooklyn uh, Bridge uh, city bound closed. The Gothels and Bayonne and Outer Bridge closed in both directions. The Man I'm just reading right off the list here. The Manhattan bound 59th and Queens Midtown Tunnel closed Manhattan bound. The Williamsburg Bridge, Manhattan Bridge, Brooklyn Bridge, and Battery Tunnel closed in both directions. Obviously a transportation nightmare. Uh, and, and also, of course, all the airports are shut down. And we should also add that a lot of foreign carriers are not allowing their aircraft to come to the United States. Um, uh, flights from France, for example, have been canceled for the duration of the day. So if you were expecting somebody to come home today, um, you can pretty much count on, on them not being able to get here. And there have been some, some phone difficulties. Um, that's because of the sheer number of people who are trying to use telephones in the New York City area right now. But again, if you're trying to get some specific numbers uh, for information, go to our website, and that's where you'll find some listings as we get these numbers into us. There's the website address, WNBC.com. Linda Baccaro is joining us now. She has been out in Midtown Manhattan and has been talking to an awful lot of people and uh, a stunning reaction and... Uh it's, it's actually good news that you're talking about people being able to get out of Manhattan because as I was walking through the streets of Midtown Manhattan, people are simply walking around in a daze, shocked, uh, confused. Here you see a car radio being the center of attention for New Yorkers, people desperate for news, people asking me as I was walking around with a television camera, uh, please give us the latest information. As you can see, any center of news, whether it was a ticker, news ticker, or a television set, uh, became the center of gathering for for New Yorkers. Many people uh, just worried about their relatives here. We see a woman at a school picking up her daughter, uh, overwhelmed with emotion. Her daughter obviously was fine, but uh, she was just overcome with emotion. That was the reaction that I saw in many New Yorkers' faces. Also, people have trouble getting out on cell phones, trying to reach their loved ones to make sure that everyone was okay. Also, we, there you see a view from 6th Avenue. This is something unbelievable. Normally, we would see the two buildings there, uh, but no longer. I'm wandering. I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I have so many friends that work down there, and I'm just... Does it seem like a lot of other people are just kind of walking around in yeah, shock as well? Yeah, mesmerized. I mean, this is huge. It's, it's unbelievable. Pretty much devastated. Um, not sure what else to say. I'm thinking of all the friends that uh, I know I have in the building somewhere. Um, hopefully they got out or, or maybe they haven't had a chance to get to work yet, hopefully. Um. Many people actually being evacuated from their office buildings in Manhattan. Uh, and now as we are hearing, as Jane and J uh, Jim are telling you, there are some ways of getting out of Manhattan if you are here, including Metro North, the Long Island Railroad, as well as the George Washington Bridge. Uh, I just can't believe this picture. This is an unbelievable picture. I'm a native New Yorker, and I've never, ever could imagine anything like this. Um, I could actually see the buildings directly from my home, and I looked out. Uh, it was just a surreal image. It certainly well, was. And to, to notice the two buildings that have dominated the New York City skyline for as long as they have, no longer there. And I, you know, I should have uh, been tick, sort of uh, tipped on something because I heard these sirens uh, throughout the streets of Manhattan. It reminded me of Atlanta. I was there during the bombing of Centennial Olympic Park, and I heard the same, you know, amount of sirens blasting through. And and I just could never imagine that it would be something like this. And then, I, of course, I turned on to the two uh, two of you watch and uh, and heard what happened. Absolutely. Who could ever imagine something? like this today and these are these are images that we took earlier today 
Uh, a lot of concern about rescue workers who are also inside these Twin Towers trying to get to people, firefighters, police officers. There are concerns about casualties among, among them. them. They, they're simply doing their job trying to save people's lives, and some of them may have given their own. Um, apparently there's some word about New Jersey Transit. Katie McGee is over at Shadow Traffic, and she's got all of this for us. Katie? Well, good morning, Jane. This, of course, has been a morning with change following moment by moment. Now, the very latest we have for you, we'll start off right now, take a look right now at the George Washington Bridge. All three Hudson River crossings, the George Washington Bridge, the Lincoln Tunnel, and the Holland Tunnel, closed in and out of town. Now, as far as New Jersey Transit goes, New Jersey Transit buses are operating within the state of New Jersey, but bus surface in and out of New York, into Penn Station, that has been suspended. Now, I can tell you that New Jersey Transit Transit trains are running as many trains as they can right now out of Penn Station to get you back home again. Now, taking a look right now, if we think about other ways to get out of town, here's what your options are at this point. Throgs Neck, Whitestone, Triborough Bridges open Queensbound only. Mid the Midtown Tunnel, the 59th Street Bridge open Queensbound only. If you're trying to get around anywhere else, you're going to find all the arteries heading into Westchester out to Long Island jam-packed at this point. Let's talk about uh, Long Island actually making some steps right now. We can tell you that police have requested all traffic westbound LIE, southern state, northern state, and Suffolk and Nassau counties stay off unless you are emergency personnel. Long Island Railroad limited outbound service is running. Southern State Parkway, westbound northern state parkway closed right now at the Queens line. Emergency vehicles only will be allowed in between the city limits. Now as far as Long Island Railroad, we did say limited outbound service. Trains in and out of Penn Station themselves suspended that limited service running from Hunters Point, Woodside, Flatbush, east of Jamaica, and on the Port Washington branch to Main Street. Now, in New Jersey, you're going to find the New Jersey Turnpike closed north of Interchange 11. Northbound 95 closed down as well. The eastbound Newark Bay Extension, which takes you from the area of Newark Airport at Exit 14 all the way into the Holland Tunnel, that closed down as well. And again, these closings have been changing minute by minute. Metro North limited outbound service if you're traveling Long Island Road. But again, we've covered that. So those are your best bets getting out of town, into town. It is not going to happen. Katie All right, McGee. Katie, obviously an awful lot of information. And again, we urge you to go to our website because there's so much to digest that if you go there, you'll be able to take a look at the information and get exactly, glean exactly what it is you need to know from that. And we'll go back to Katie periodically so we can keep abreast of the latest on the closings uh, and ways to get out of Manhattan. We want to go right now to Teresa Ward, who we understand was in the number two World Trade Center this morning when this attack occurred. Teresa, are you there? Yes, I am. What can you tell us? What was it like? Well, it was uh, a little surreal, actually. We, I was just sitting at my desk having my coffee, starting my day, and we felt a shudder. And I did, we didn't really know what it was at first. And when we looked out the window, it was just floating papers uh, as if some, you know, there was like a ticker tape parade. There was just papers floating to the ground. And having had the experience of the uh, 1993 bombing, everybody on my floor sort of, immediately evacuated very calmly and we walked down the stairs and as we got to about the ninth floor we heard an announcement saying that there was an incident in one world trade and that everything was fine in two world trade and that we could return to our offices and myself and a co-worker then got on an elevator to go downstairs you know ignoring the, the announcement and when we got downstairs it was a little chaotic but at that point everything was pretty calm but when I got outside, the second explosion must have just occurred because there was debris flying everywhere, and we had to run for cover and hide. And then the emergency service workers shuttled us back into the World Trade Center where we were able to um, exit through the subway exits. Teresa, so what floor uh, were you on? I was on the 33rd floor of Two World Trade Center. And where do you work? At Oppenheimer Funds. What do you know about uh, your co-workers? Did everybody get out of there safely? As far as I know, everybody on my floor is okay. I was able to contact a number of people who, you know, through different channels were able to, to contact everybody. I, I think because we were on a lower floor in the other building, most of us got out safely. So, um, you know, thank God, um, you know, most of us are okay as far as I know. But I haven't heard from everybody. I don't know if people were caught in any of the debris as they exited the building or anything, because I was, you know, 
uh, there was a, a steel beam 30 feet from me falling to the ground, and there was, you know, blocks of cement crashing to the ground and burning debris floating in the air. So it was um, quite something else. And when I got to Houston Street, we saw a crowd yelling, and we turned, and we saw that Two World Trade Center was no longer there. That would be your workplace. That is my office, which is no longer... Uh, you know, I can't even, I don't even know what I'm supposed to do now. I think you uh, express the feelings of many, many people here in New York City. Yeah. Teresa, thank you for um, sharing your experience with us. We appreciate it, and we're awfully glad that you got out of there safely. So am I. Thank you very much. Um, we are expecting the president to address the nation in the not-too-distant future. We hear that he's going to do that. And um, I can't urge you enough to check in on our website at WNBC.com um, for further information, just simple facts that you need to get through this day. Um, and again, the state of the nation is on high alert. You cannot come into this city, and you must take great precaution getting out of it. And um, we will have continuing coverage. We're going to go back and rejoin the network now. The plane went into the World Trade Center. We stood in there, you could see, you could see outside, it looked like a war zone. Debris, dust, ankle deep, cars on fire, cars turned to skew in the explosion. We decided to stay inside. I was there with some firemen and some maintenance workers of this building. We decided to stay in there because it appeared to be safer inside. Then at about 10.30, it looked like everything was all clear. I started to walk out. I walked down Broadway towards Canal, and we heard the second, a second explosion. I ran back into the building. All the chandeliers shook. Again, we were covered with black debris from everywhere. At that point, a fireman came into the building and said we all had to stay in one place. He then told us all to get out of the building because they felt if there was a third explosion that this building would be in danger. And then I walked down Broadway to Canal, to Canal Street, and it was like walking through something that looked like out of a movie set of a nuclear holocaust. It was nothing but debris and, and papers and, and all... Listen. Parts of buildings Listen. down and glass. Could you, can we please move? I will, please. sir. Could I you will. Tell right the right now, yeah. please. Tell the people, and please move back. They're right, right, obviously, Ann Thompson. Ann, thank you very much for that report. Uh, Ann's being asked to, to move her location. Obviously, uh, firefighters and police officers are frantically trying to help those people who have been hurt who perhaps have not been rescued or perhaps to retrieve even bodies and as a result of this. So many people in this country obviously in a state of shock over what's happened in several locations, but at times like this you do find people who try to rally to do what they can at St. Vincent's Hospital, which is just south of the World Trade Center, where they've taken a lot of the wounded, 184 patients in total, 10 critical. There are lines now of people who are showing up to donate blood which is, is something heartening you know, in it, the face of this tragedy. Catherine Hughes is at Virginia Hospital Center uh, where many of the people who were hurt at the Pentagon where yet another plane crashed uh, early this morning um, is, is uh, here to tell us what the situation is. Is this the old Arlington Hospital, Catherine? Yes, it is, Katie. Can you tell us about the people you're seeing there? We now have approximately 26 patients. We are expecting more. They're coming in um, at the moment. Um, we have called in additional surgeons, nurses, and other staff members to help with this crisis. And um, we've seen ba basically a variety of medical issues coming in. We do have some in surgery at this time. So uh, tell me about the medical issues that these individuals are experiencing, Catherine, if you could. As I said, there are a variety of medical issues, um, some severe and, and some not. We do have some cuts, burns, um, people coming in with shortness of breath. We took our first person at about 1035 this morning, and they are coming from the Pentagon area. Catherine, if you could give us an idea, is this the only area hospital that is treating people who are inside the Pentagon at the time of the crash, or have they been diverted to other hospitals as well? I don't know that. I know that we have, re we have already seen 26, and we currently are receiving patients at this time. A Navy Public Affairs uh, spokesperson has confirmed or apparently told a local station in Washington that people have um, lost their lives inside the Pentagon. And you expect how many more patients, Catherine? We're expecting patients. Um, we don't know how many. We are just taking them All at right. this time. All right. Catherine Hughes at uh, Virginia Hospital Center, formerly known as Arlington Hospital. Catherine, thanks so much for talking with us. We appreciate your time. Thank you.
Just to recap where the president was when this occurred, just before 9 o'clock this morning, he was taking part in an education event in near Longboat Key, Florida. He was actually, we understand, reading to students down there when he first got word of the first plane crashing into the World Trade Center, and then he was given word that a second plane had crashed into the other tower. He did have a chance to make some comments before heading out of Florida, and, and here's a, a sample of what he had to say. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a difficult moment for America. I um, unfortunately will be going back to Washington after my remarks. Secretary of Rod Page and Lieutenant Governor <clears throat> will take the podium and discuss education. I do want to thank the folks here at, uh, at the Booker Elementary School for their hospitality. Uh, today we've had a national tragedy. Uh, two airplanes have crashed into the World Trade Center in an apparent terrorist attack on our country. I have spoken to the Vice President, to the Governor of New York, to the Director of the FBI, and have ordered that the full resources of the federal government uh, go to help the victims and their families and, the f and to conduct a full-scale investigation to hunt down and to find those folks who committed this act. Terrorism against our nation will not stand. And now if you join me in a moment of silence. I want to mention that President Bush is said to have made a couple of other comments. He said that freedom itself was attacked, freedom will be protected, and that the U.S. will hunt down and punish those responsible. Just to, go ahead. He also said that the U.S. military was on high alert at home and abroad. Just to update you on the situation, we told you that there had been several international flights en route to the United States. The original plan from the FAA was to divert those to Canada. We now understand that they will be allowed to land in the U.S. The FAA is not saying why they're not going forward with their original plans to divert to Canada. And we don't have any information on the points of origin or the destinations of those 22 planes. NBC's Campbell Brown is standing by in Washington. Campbell? Well, Matt, what we can tell you is that we do know the president now is at the Barksdale Air Force Base. That's in Shreveport, Louisiana, northern Louisiana. He flew there from Florida, where he was this morning. And it was interesting because in those uh, early minutes, shortly after Air Force One took off from Florida, uh, no one was told within the White House press corps where the president was, where he was going. Our information now is coming from what we call the travel pool. It is one network reporter who is on board the plane with the president. Uh, he did make uh, a brief statement. We're waiting to get more on what he said when they landed at Barksdale Air Force Base. We're not sure whether or not he's going to stay there or that they will take the president somewhere else. Uh, there are a number of options. Obviously, there's a bunker in Colorado Springs that the military runs. There is the so-called doomsday plane, which is another option. This is a, an aircraft that is far more sophisticated than Air Force One. It has the, the most advanced electronic equipment on board where the president could communicate with anyone from that plane. It can stay in the air. It can be refueled in the air. So it is something that was designed and built in the event that there was a nuclear attack, but it is a possible option today if they feel like they need that. Of course, the president, when he was in Florida and initially made those remarks you played a moment ago, he did say he was coming back from Washington, but obviously now they're reevaluating the situation to try to figure out where it may be best for him to operate from. There are a few officials still at the White House now. His national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, and other key officials are in the White House. We're told they're operating out of the Situation Room and that a few areas of the White House have been designated as so-called hard rooms, meaning special Secret Service agents uh, are there guarding the few key people who are needed to stay at the White House. The rest of the White House has been evacuated. But the president is obviously in close contact with his national security team, who is remaining there for the time being. He was informed of this while he was in Florida at an education event this morning of the first incident when the first plane flew into the World Trade Center. He was told by phone by his national security advisor, Condoleezza Rice, while he was in a holding room, while he was about to go out and speak to some elementary school children. Then while he was actually reading to these students, a note was passed him from his chief of staff, Andy Card. Uh, in the pictures you can see, 
uh, the reaction on the president's face, uh, as shocked as the rest of us at what had happened. And, and his plans immediately changed initially to come back to Washington. But now, again, the Barksdale Air Force Base in Shreveport, Louisiana, and we'll be waiting for the word on where he will go from here and where, where he will sort of command the military operations, uh, given the situation. Matt? All right, Campbell, thank you very much. Katie? Meanwhile, Matt, Cardinal Egan of the New York Archdiocese is joining us now. He has been outside St. Vincent's Hospital here in Manhattan delivering last rites to some of the people who have been brought to that hospital. Your Eminence, uh, thank you for talking with us. Can you tell us or describe the scene for us, if you could? Well, I've been here since the very beginning. We have 184 patients here at St. Vincent's Hospital in Lower Manhattan. Ten are critical, and six are of the police department or the fire department. So far, two have passed away. The uh, situation has been that the doctors and the nurses are waiting outside here. The hospital is completely mobilized, and uh, we believe that uh, we will be able to handle whomever they send. Uh, we understand that Bellevue Hospital and St. Vincent's Hospital are the two places where they'll be sending the most critically injured and that they do have triage down closer to uh, the two centers. I have to say this, that I've uh, taken care of a lot of people spiritually, uh, anointed a lot of people, and I've no limit to my admiration for what I've seen of the doctors, the nurses, and the staff, and the administration of St. Vincent's Hospital. And I'm told that that is what is to be found throughout this great city of New York. We're addressing this the way New Yorkers address things, with a prayer and with a total commitment to help everyone who is hurting, and especially to make it clear to families and others that we will be doing the very best we can for their loved ones. Well, I right. have here Dr. Ackerman, if you'd like to speak to him. Sure, that, the, that would be great. Here Dr. he is right now. Dr. Ackerman, um, are you an emergency the, physician there? Dr. Ackerman, it's Katie Couric. Thank you for talking with us. Thank you. Can you tell us a little bit about the situation there and how the patients are doing? I know that you have about 184 patients, is that correct? Uh, that's correct, Katie. And actually the number is growing as uh, the minutes go on. When the uh, first ambulances came in, there were 10 uh, or 11 people in each of them. Now that the triage centers are set up downtown, we're getting fewer patients at the moment, but we're getting the most critically injured. Uh, severe burns, several heart attacks, multiple traumas, uh, many broken bones. and. Probably what's most striking is that everyone that's coming is coming full of gray powder from the massive explosions that obviously took place. Uh, there are uh, family uh, centers set up here at the uh, medical center. Uh, there's a special number that family members can call to try to find out if their loved one is here at St. Vincent's. That's area code 212-604-7285. And the uh, New York City Police Department's working very closely with us. Uh, we're very grateful that His Eminence has been here to help us and our staff, and uh, we continue to be prepared. I was here for the last major incident um, at the, with the World Trade Center, and this, uh, in my opinion, is uh, many, many times worse. Well, Dr. Ackerman, do you have enough people on staff to uh, take care of the, the hundreds of people who are there already and, and the other people who may be arriving at your hospital? Um, we are very well staffed right now, Katie. We uh, are a little bit concerned, though, about later in the day. Um, people will obviously uh, wear down the number of traumas that you can handle, that one can handle not only physically but psychologically. And so we're asking all of the uh, people that call us at this point in time, time to please check with us around 5 or 6 o'clock this evening mm -hmm. because we fear we're going to need another shift of workers to handle uh, the tragedy of this magnitude. All right, we heard that people were standing in line to donate blood, and of course that was heartening news for us to hear under the circumstances. Dr. Ackerman, thank you very much. I know you're very, very busy, so we'll let you get back to work. Thank you. Now, Katie, we've been showing basically video of New York and the World Trade Centers, or where the World Trade Centers used to be, and of Washington and the Pentagon, and, and we've forgotten somewhat to remind people that there was the crash of another plane a fourth plane outside Pittsburgh, about 80 miles from Pittsburgh, and we don't have video of that story at the moment. That's one of the reasons we haven't been talking about it as much, but that's the fourth prong in this terrorist attack on U.S. soil, and that it's just information we'll be trying to get as the, as the day progresses. In fact, we want to just repeat those airline numbers, which is... Um, you know, extremely upsetting news for people who had loved ones on these flights, but we want to give you that information. The four aircraft involved, 
American Airline flight, Airlines Flight 11 from Boston to Los Angeles, United Airlines Flight 175 from Boston to Los Angeles. Then there was American Airlines Flight number 77 from Dulles, Washington Dulles to Los Angeles. And finally, United Flight 93, the plane you just referred to that crashed outside of Pittsburgh, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. It was from Newark en route to San Francisco. Here are the phone numbers if, if you'd like to inquire if you, you think you had a family member or a loved one on board any of those planes, American Airlines to set up a number at 1-800-245-0999 and United Airlines, 1-800-932-8555. You mentioned that we have not shown shots of Pittsburgh and the United Airlines plane that crashed in Somerset County, Pennsylvania. We have the first uh, shots, pretty shaky video of that airplane that uh, crashed shortly after the two planes crashed into the World Trade Tower. At least we got the information. And after that other plane crashed into the Pentagon. In short, and, and you really can't put this story into short form, this has been perhaps the most devastating day uh, in American history in terms of terrorism. It certainly has been four separate attacks, obviously coordinated and coordinated fairly thoroughly, two on the World Trade Center here in New York, one on the Pentagon in Washington, D.C., a fourth, the hijacking and crash of a plane, as you just saw, outside Pittsburgh. Unclear now as to how many lives have been lost, but the numbers are bound to be staggering That's as right. the day progresses. Aboard those airplanes alone, 266 people have lost their lives. That was confirmed by both United and American Airlines. And we are unclear, as Matt just said, about the perhaps thousands of people who have been killed and certainly injured as a result of what happened in New York City and outside Washington, D.C. at the Pentagon. With more, here's Tom. This is an NBC News special report. Here is Tom Brokaw. September 11th, the year 2001, a day unlike any other in the long course of American history, a terrorist act of war against this country. President Bush saying today that freedom has been attacked by a faceless coward and freedom will be defended. Not since Pearl Harbor was attacked on December 7, 1941, has this country undergone such a devastating and damaging attack and it may not yet be over. We do know at this time that at least four targets have been attacked. The two twin trade tower centers here in New York City, the Pentagon, and then another plane that was crashed deliberately into an area outside of Pittsburgh. That is the second plane hitting the twin trade towers this morning. All of them hijacked airliners. Then these two colossal icons of the American capitalist system collapsed in lower Manhattan. The death toll at this hour is unknown, but it is expected to be, as Mayor Giuliani has said, horrendous. Shortly after those attacks on the twin trade towers in New York City at the Pentagon in one of the outer rings, another hijacked airliner crashed into two areas there, killing an untold number of U.S. military personnel in Washington, D.C. A code red was put in effect in the nation's capital. The White House, State Department, CIA evacuated along with the Pentagon. House Speaker Dennis Hastert was evacuated to a secure area. President Bush, who was in Florida for an appearance for an education project, was evacuated to Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana, where we do expect to hear from him before too long. The United States is in effect in a national state of emergency. All domestic flights were grounded immediately. Most flights that were already in the air, we believe, will arrive safely at their destinations. The borders between the United States and Canada and the United States and Mexico have been closed. Transatlantic flights were diverted to Canada. U.S. military forces in this country and around the world have been put on the highest possible alert. Aircraft carriers were moved to waters off New York City as this scene played out in the nerve center of this country, lower Manhattan, the financial markets, an area that is home to literally hundreds of thousands of people, they are still dealing with the carnage in lower Manhattan. 
We want to go now to NBC's David Bloom, who is in Midtown Manhattan, overlooking all of this. As you can see there, communications have been severely interrupted. David? Well, Tom, what we're looking at behind us more than four hours after the first explosion is the smoking hulk of the essentially vanished World Trade Center. As you've said, the essential question at this hour in, the, in New York City is how many people may have died in these attacks. The various officials here in New York City believe that the casualty officials, the casualty estimates will essentially go into the thousands and thousands of people. Here is the sequence of events as they happened at this hour. The first plane attacks the World Trade Center's South Tower at approximately 8.42 Eastern Time. Airline officials say at least two American Airlines flights and two United Airlines flights were hijacked today and that the attack planes were the hijacked domestic flights. Roughly 21 minutes later, approximately 9.03 Eastern Time, the second large jetliner can be seen taking dead aim at the World Trade Center's North Tower. Emergency officials estimate 20,000 or more people may have been inside the two 110-story buildings at the time of the attacks. Eyewitnesses report victims falling and in some cases jumping from the two buildings. At approximately 9.40 a.m. in Washington, D.C., a third hijacked plane crashes into the Pentagon in a burst of flames, one side of the building collapsing. Non-essential personnel from federal buildings, including the White House and the U.S. Capitol, are evacuated. 9.59 a.m., the South Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. An unknown number of people still trapped inside. One half hour later, at approximately 10.28 a.m., the North Tower of the World Trade Center collapses. Rubble, debris spreading for blocks. In a separate but apparently related crash, a fourth hijacked plane, a Boeing 767, crashes in western Pennsylvania, about 80 miles southeast of Pittsburgh. The FAA closes all domestic airports, shutting down all U.S. airspace. So again, Tom, four hijacked airplanes. We know what happened to each of the four. Other officials investigating now, both apparently the worst terrorist attack in the mainland United States ever. Tom. Thanks very much, NBC's David Bloom. What we don't know is who may be responsible for these attacks. There's a lot of speculation, obviously, about Osama bin Laden, who is a Saudi dissident who is believed to be harbored somewhere in Afghanistan, but no one is claiming responsibility. In the West Bank, however, the Palestinians in the streets are cheering and celebrating these attacks on the, on the United States, even though Palestinian leaders have condemned the attacks. We want to go now to NBC's Pat Dawson, who is down near the World Trade Center, because the big question, obviously, in New York City and across this country, when how many people have been able to survive this horrendous attack? Pat? Tom, right now, hundreds of rescue workers are massed here on the southern tip of uh, New York in Manhattan Island waiting for a possibility uh, where they can go back in in large numbers to begin searching through the debris. Obviously, the first task at hand will be to find anyone who is still alive in there. There really is no precedent for this. Uh, two 110-story buildings, uh, first of all, the impact of those two planes into them, and then the buildings themselves literally tumbling down into the streets. Uh, it's the sort of thing that one assumes very few people could have survived, but the task of those rescue workers, and if you look behind me, you can see it, many of them massed down there, uh, the task will be for them to go back in and to try to find anyone who is alive, first of all. That is, of course, the priority. Uh, they know. We have spoken to a number of them. Of course, common sense tells us as well they are going to find uh, a very, very high number of dead bodies in there as well. No way. We have spoken to officials here uh, with the police department and with fire. Uh, they all say the same thing. This kind of a catastrophe, there's no way of knowing how many people that they're going to find in there, how many people are dead, how many people are alive. There's really no way to know how difficult their task is going to be going in there and trying to dig through the remains of two 110-story buildings that are now lying at the bottom of Manhattan. Uh, obviously, taking care of those that are hurt that they have been able to get out is a first priority. There are literally, uh, I would say, probably a mile-long line of uh, uh, ambulances and rescue vehicles along this stretch of the West Side Highway in the lower part of Manhattan. Just on the right here is a uh, community college in New York. 
Uh, that college is uh, the triage center for those they've been able to take out. But I can tell you at this point that at least on, from this vantage point where we have seen most people going in and out, there have been, relatively speaking, very few ambulances going out of here in the last three to four hours. Tom? All right, thank you very much, uh, Pat Dawson. Uh, one of my colleagues who is right in the middle of the collapse of those buildings is uh, CNBC's Ron Insana, who went down with a cameraman hoping to get close to the World Trade Center, and then it began to come down, the first one. Ron, take us through what you experienced. Well, Tom, uh, much of the area had been, in fact, cordoned off, uh, and the cameraman from MSNBC and I were trying to get across to the west side of the World Trade Center in order to hook up with the rest of the NBC crews that we knew were there. As we were moving towards the building, we saw the top begin to blow out in a plume of smoke, and we heard the noise uh, associated with an implosion. We turned and immediately ran for cover in the other direction as debris began to rain down. As we made our way, John going straight down the street, I taking a right turn around a corner, uh, it got increasingly dark. The skies blackened as the material just continued to rain down. I, I hid briefly behind a car, uh, and as the material got thicker and thicker and it became increasingly difficult to breathe, I got inside a parked car, a random parked car, and uh, hid there basically until uh, the material stopped falling. It was pitch black, black as night uh, inside that car, and for several minutes I remained there until some flickers of light were able to be seen. I made my way to a building and joined some police officers who were inside, and as, as the blackness began to lift and, and this gray, thick smoke uh, clung in the air, uh, we were able to, to find a police car and make our way out of the area. The police been stopping along the way to pick up two injured people and, and leave them at, at a Midtown hospital and subsequently made my way here. What about collateral damage to other buildings in the area? The, those, of course, are the classic canyons of lower Manhattan. And as that, as that building came down, it did create a kind of tornadic wind that went through there. Absolutely. Much like uh, the images that were created for the movie Independence Day, uh, when New York was exploding, the corridors of lower Lower Manhattan are so narrow and channel so much wind, even uh, just on a, a plain windy day, that this material blew through in a way that was really unimaginable. It was truly frightening. Uh, it continued to rain down for several minutes, as you can see there, and, and the winds just whipped through these corridors uh, for several minutes, eventually calming down to such an extent where there was just a thick gray haze throughout the entire area, Tom. All right, thanks very much, uh, CNBC's Ron Insana, who was right in the middle of it all today. New York City effectively has been shut down. All tunnels in and out of the city have been closed for security reasons. The airports are closed. The subways are closed. Traffic has been removed from the streets. All hospitals are on extra alert. One right kind of uh, in the middle of it all at ground zero is St. Vincent's Hospital. And NBC's Robert Bazell is there as he has been all morning. Robert, any additional word on casualties? Well, uh, Tom, actually there have been about 200 casualties, some of them very severe, uh, uh, at least eight deaths, and five of those were firefighters or policemen. We're not sure of which, which one. But one of the things that's amazing about being here is that it has been much slower than anyone anticipated. There ha that's a lot of casualties, of course, and it's, uh, but the casualties have been coming out of lower Manhattan at a much slower speed than people anticipated. I think just because the, as one rescue worker who had been down there told me, it's just hell down there. You can't move around. You can't uh, discern who's what, a body part from a living human being in, in several of the areas. So we have a very dedicated staff standing by. Large numbers of medical workers are ready to uh, attend to anybody who appears. Bob. Several have been very severely injured, but we're still waiting. All right, Bob. Uh, we, we now have the videotape of President Bush, who was diverted from Florida to Barksdale Air Force Base near Shreveport, Louisiana. This is what he had to say to the nation moments ago. We have been in touch with the leaders of Congress and with world leaders to assure them that we will do what is, whatever is necessary to protect America and Americans. I ask the American people to join me in saying a thanks for all the folks who have been fighting hard to rescue our fellow citizens and to join me in saying a prayer for the victims and their families. The resolve of our great nation is being tested, but make no mistake, 
we will show the world that we will pass this test. God bless. President George W. Bush, in his capacity today, not only as President of the United States, but also as Commander-in-Chief as U.S. military forces around the world, are on the highest possible alert. There is so much uncertainty in this situation. Who is responsible? When it could happen again? And where? These are questions that are still unresolved as we try to work our way through this day. I'm joined on the telephone now by the former National Security Advisor in the Clinton Administration, Sandy Berger, a longtime veteran of National Security Matters in this country. Mr. Berger, in all of your contingency planning during your days in the White House, did you ever anticipate anything like this? Four hijacked airliners that would be driven into the uh, Twin Trade Towers and the Pentagon? Well, Tom, I, I, I think for some time uh, we have known that, that uh, terrorism is the greatest security threat that, that this country faced. Um, we've seen some uh, uh, horrible uh, uh, incidents here before. We, we, we broke up a multi-pronged effort on, on Millennium Weekend, but this uh, certainly goes beyond anything that we have uh, seen before in its uh, dimensions and sophistication. As we work our way through this day of shock and grief and still trying to count the number of casualties, we also have to say, however, that there has been a stunning failure of intelligence at the highest possible level. The American people are going to wonder why they spent billions of dollars of intelligence if we can't find out about a complex operation like this that involves so many people. Well, I think all of that uh, is going to have to be sifted out. I think that in the midst of our outrage and anger, uh, President Bush is right. We have to show to the world show the world that we will respond to this uh, uh, both with determination uh, uh, and with uh, uh, steadiness. That means first, uh, obviously, focusing on security and on on rescue, uh, then on uh, uh, determining who's responsible, and this is of such magnitude that it's inconceivable to me that we will not uh, soon know what the, what the origin of this is. Uh, and then uh, uh, how we did not detect this, uh, since it obviously involved uh, a multiple uh, operation based on uh, in, from the United States. But blame, I think... Uh, the blame game, I think, uh, is comes, in my judgment, after we uh, do everything we can to take care of the people who are in those buildings. We uh, assure the security of others who may be uh, in situations uh, that are vulnerable, and we find out uh, who is responsible for this absolutely horrifying set of events. Mr. Berger, it's just not a matter of assigning blame. That's not the question. The question is, how do we get our intelligence back on track so it doesn't happen again in the next 20 minutes or the next 20 hours? Well, I think we have to recognize as, uh, uh, that this is uh, uh, the overwhelming security threat to the nation, uh, more so than, uh, than any foreign nation, more so than uh, long-range missiles. Uh, uh, terrorism has been and continues to be uh, the number one threat to, to our people. Um, and... Uh, uh, I think the intelligence community uh, has has intensified uh, its efforts over the years, but this simply demonstrates that uh, we're certainly not doing enough. Sandy Berger, thank you very much for being with us today on what is obviously a day of great trial for this country, a great tragedy, and we have to determine how we go from here once we do begin to sort out just how many lives were lost, who was responsible for all of this, and how we can protect ourselves from this kind of attack again in the future as it continues to play out across America. Uh, Robert Knowles is on the phone with us now. He was on the 54th floor, I'm told, of one of the World Trade Center buildings when one of the planes was flown into it. Mr. Knowles, you're safely at home? Yes, sir. Could you turn down your television? I can hear it in the background, and that will cause us some problems if yes, we sir. continue our discussion. Okay. Tell me exactly where you were and what happened to you. I was on the 54th floor. Of number one building or number two? Number one building. Uh -huh. And what, what, when were you first aware of the attack? Well, something hit the building, and it knocked me to the floor. And then the whole window blew out of my, the office I was in. 
and it snatched the desk out of the office like it was a piece of paper. And how did you get out of that office? By the grace of God, I was holding on to the door so I wouldn't be sucked out the window. And then, did you go down the stairs? Yeah, going down the stairs was really rough because it was, it, 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 from the 30th floor down, it was water, it, the sprinklers was on. And then I, I, I pray to God for the people in the wheelchairs because they couldn't get out. They were sitting there waiting for somebody to carry them down. How many people did you see like that, Mr. Knowles? Two people. They were invalids, you know, they couldn't get out the wheelchairs. It wasn't a regular wheelchair. It was the kind of wheelchair where they do everything in a wheelchair. It was a heavy mechanical wheelchair of some kind. Yes, sir. And then as you made your way to the bottom, of that stairwell was crowded with other people trying to get out? Yes, sir, but God bless the fact that it happened early because if it had happened at 1030, it would have been chaos because you couldn't get down the stairs between the smoke and the lights being out in the water it, 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 and, the, and the staircase was slippery. When you finally got to the ground floor, then what happened? Then they just, they, they heard us out of the building. They told us to walk fast. We walked up towards uh, Broadway up Nassau and it was glass blown from everywhere. When you were in your office, when the first explosion occurred, that was the first building that was hit? Yes, sir. And were there lots of people in the building at that hour? It was, it was a good amount of people, but not lots. And it was not full to capacity? No, thank God. And were there other people who, so far as you could tell, were either uh, seriously hurt or killed in the first explosion that you could find? No, people, the, everybody I seen was, able, was mobile. They were able to get out the building. You know, people were coughing, people fell on the stairs. They weren't hurt from the explosion. They were hurt trying to get out of the building. Okay, Mr. Knowles, we uh, wish you the very best. And by the grace of God, you were able to get out of there. And we know that this has been a difficult time for you. But we thank you for sharing uh, your experience with us today. Thank you. I'm going to go to Washington now. Senator John McCain, who has declared this an act of war on the United States. It's already being described as a kind of... 21st century Pearl Harbor, Senator McCain. Uh, I think that's accurate uh, in many respects, uh, Tom, although um, clearly uh, the implications of this are, are very significant, and including the fact that uh, at least we knew who, exactly who it was that uh, took, the, took these actions against the United States at Pearl Harbor. And obviously at this point we don't know who it was or, or which organization or our nation may have been sponsoring this kind of activity. We're obviously in the early stages dealing still with the shock and the grief, trying to count the number of casualties, but this country will have to take immediate action in terms of how we rearrange ourselves now to hope that we don't have this happen again. Uh, we're going to have to have some profound changes in America, Senator. I'm, I'm afraid so. I think that our lifestyles will not be the same for a very long period of time because of security requirements. Uh, I also think that, as you, uh, I was watching you earlier, there is going to have to be an evaluation about our intelligence capability, and part of that evaluation will be recognition that we don't have the kind of human intelligence capabilities that perhaps uh, we need. We have excellent technical capabilities, but. A lot of times you have to have someone on the ground to penetrate these organizations so you can know their intentions uh, rather than, than their actions. But, uh, look, this is a terrible, uh, unspeakable act. Uh, I believe the American people will support, rally behind, and support the President of the United States. And I believe that we will find out who did this, and I think we will respond. And I don't know how you could describe it, very frankly, any other way but an act of war. You grew up in the conventional military, and we have such an investment in all of that, but for some time, national security officials across all administrations have been saying the great threat to this country is terrorism. Have we devoted enough attention to this kind of an act? I, it's very difficult for me to second guess. I think there's going to be plenty of, of that kind of activity. I, I would repeat that 
when I talk to people in the field and when I travel around the world, our lack of human intelligence capability. Part of that is the difficulty in penetrating some of these organizations. Is as you know, they're they're very difficult. But uh, that may be an area that that would have to be addressed. Uh, our technical capabilities, our satellites, and others are are absolutely superb and sometimes uh, phenomenal. But you've got to divine people's motives, uh, as I said. You've got to you've got to get these things before the act is being being carried out, and that's probably an area that we have to look at. But I, I'm sure uh, that that this administration and the Congress will will devote all their efforts to making sure not only that the people who perpetrated it are punished, but also that uh, it never happens again. Senator, is it too early to speculate on whether or not we're going to need protective air cover over the nation's capital in some of our more critical areas? I, I, I don't know. I, I do know that average citizens are going to find it a, a much more complicated process going to an airport and getting on it, onto an airplane. That'll be one of the first, obviously, one of the first and necessary evaluations that are needed because I think it's pretty clear now that these planes were hijacked and how they were able to, to do that uh, in the case of at least four airplanes is, uh, is, is going to be a subject of great interest and, and perhaps some controversy because there's been this issue of security at airports for a long period of time. How much inconvenience versus how much security, which has been one of debate that's been in Congress and, and, and in other areas of government as well. So uh, I, I think that that rather than attacking it from having air cover over the Capitol, perhaps we ought to devote our efforts to going places where this, uh, these acts of terror originate. That would probably be much more effective and cost-effective as well. Senator, uh, we're still dealing, as I say, with the in initial stages of shock, but in fact, it is hard to overstate the magnitude of all of this or the continuing effect that it will have on the business of this nation. Oh, I, I, I don't, there's never been anything like this in our lifetime. Uh, Pearl Harbor was a horrible and dastardly deed, uh, and I don't like to compare it to Pearl Harbor, but this, this, is, this is unprecedented in its scope and, and, frankly, its efficiency. Senator John McCain, thank you very much for being with thank us you, today. Tom. Thank you. Under these very difficult circumstances, it's also worth pointing out that in Pearl Harbor, it was a military attack on a military installation. This was an attack by terrorists using innocent American civilians, for the most part, in hijacked airliners directed at targets filled with civilians, with the exception of the Pentagon, obviously. Let's go to NBC's Robert Hager now for an update. Four planes hijacked today, Bob, two United, two American. Bring us up to date. With a total toll just in the airplanes, so thousands dead, presumably on the ground, but just in the airplanes, 266 dead. She said two American planes, two United planes. Uh, two of those planes were taking off from Boston, one from Newark, and one from Washington, Dulles. Uh, two went into the World Trade Center buildings, one went into the Pentagon, and one crashed in rural Pennsylvania with no idea where that one was being hijacked to. At last report, and this report was about... Uh, 40 minutes ago, there were still only, there were now only 50 planes left in the air, 50 commercial flights over domestic U.S. airspace. So that, that is saying no new flights were being allowed to take off, haven't since 9.30 Eastern time this morning. Uh, the planes that were already in the air were allowed to continue on. There were only 50 of those still in the air. Uh, they were mostly about 20 minutes away from airports, so presumably almost all of those should have landed by now. There were also 22 international flights still in the air heading here initially the word was they were going to be diverted to Canada and then the decision was made that that would be just too hard for Canadians to handle and so those 22 flights were going to be allowed to land in the US uh, so far we don't know of any of them landing but this is a very important point. The FAA knew of no problems with any of those 50 planes still in the air in the U.S. or 22 in international airspace bound here. So that would seem to indicate that the problems are over in terms of these hijackings. Uh, just to run the flights down very quickly, uh, the first was an American airliner, Boston to Los Angeles. There were 92 killed on board that one. It went into the World Trade Center. That was the first event. Then there was a United plane leaving from Boston. Six 
65 were killed on it. It also went into the World Trade Center. It too, as the American plane before it, was supposed to have been bound Boston to Los Angeles. Then there was an American airliner leaving from Dulles Airport bound for Los Angeles, 64 aboard, and it crashed into the Pentagon. And finally, a United flight leaving Newark Airport bound for San Francisco. It went into rural Pennsylvania, so we don't know what its intended target was. Now, in ter terms of what Senator McCain was talking about, when you think of a, of a plane being hijacked, you've got to get the hijackers aboard and you have to get some sort of deathly weapon aboard, like a gun or some explosives. And there are two ways to do that. Either they go through passenger screening and manage to sneak through passenger screening without getting caught, or you get behind the doors somehow and sneak those people aboard behind passenger screening as though they were an airport employee. Uh, there have been uh, investigations done uh, on both those things. The FAA tests them a lot uh, with plainclothes people to see if they get through, and every time they do it, a sizable percentage do get through passenger yep. screening with mock weapons or mock explosives. And the same thing on the, on the employees behind the lines. A sizable number do manage to get through the doors. So we'll be seeing in coming days uh, what it was that led to all this. Tom? Bob, any indication from the FAA of radio traffic indicating that there was a hijacking underway? No, what, what it is in the cockpit, uh, presuming that an armed person in the course of a hijacking, an armed person or somebody with explosives has broken into the cockpit, uh, the, the, and the pilot therefore cannot say it over the open radio because the hijacker uh, would take action against the pilot. So there's a button that you push and the button sends out a code and it tells the uh, appropriate air traffic controllers and word is flashed to Washington immediately that there's a hijacking in progress. So one could presume that that happened in all four of these flights. Of course, we don't know at the moment, but it certainly must have. Then you wonder too, uh, because the targets were hit so precisely, uh, is that somebody standing behind a pilot and saying, okay, now fly this right into a World Trade Center tower? Or is it an experienced pilot, the hijacker himself, who gets the pilot out of his seat and takes over at the controls to guide it in at the last minute? We don't know, of course. Yeah. All right, thanks very much. Uh, NBC's Robert Hager, who will be monitoring the uh, airline part of all of this. The uh, four hijacked airliners, in effect, became guided missiles in the hands of terrorists who hijacked the plane. They took innocent people to death with them, 266 altogether. Uh, President Bush is at Barksdale Air Force Base in Louisiana at this time. We're told other senior members of the Bush administration are in secure positions. There's code red at uh, the Capitol right now. House Speaker Dennis Hastert was removed to a secure position. All financial markets have been closed down. All national monuments have been evacuated across America in places like Minneapolis, Kentucky, Los Angeles, and San Francisco. A number of critical installations have been closed down as well. This country, the most powerful in the world, has been in effect semi-immobilized today by these terrorist attacks. And we can only hope that they are now all over with. When we heard this morning at 842 that the World Trade Center had been attacked, we thought that that was a single uh, a solitary and horrifying event. Not too long after that, the second one was hit. And then NBC's Jim McLeshevsky here on NBC said an explosion was felt at the Pentagon. And that was a plane that went into the Pentagon, another airliner near the hillip had there. It uh, fortunately was on the far side of the building from the most critical offices housing uh, the joint chairman of the Joint Chiefs and the Intelligence Center. And of course, Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld who at first did not want to evacuate the building, and then he was persuaded that that was in the best national interest of this country to do just that. And then, of course, we had uh, the situation in Pennsylvania where a United Airliner crashed into the ground. It, too, had been hijacked. James Lee Witt is the former head of the Federal Emergency Administration in the Clinton administration. Uh, he was well known during uh, his tenure there because there were so many natural disasters around the country. So what, what is FEMA doing at this hour? Well, Tom, I'm sure that they've already activated the operations center and also talking to uh, the city of New York emergency management and uh, Governor Pataki's office in putting together whatever resources they can to support their efforts in meeting that immediate need. And, and I'm sure they're probably activating some search and rescue teams. Probably. I, go ahead. I know, James, from our own experiences together that you had... Uh, lots of contingency plans for tornadoes and for hurricanes, those kinds of natural disasters. What did you have uh, in planning at FEMA for a terrorist attack? 
Well, of course, you know, after the Oklahoma City bombing, Tom, we've worked very hard in putting together a, a very strong federal response plan in which they have continued uh, to work on, particularly adding the uh, terrorist uh, component to that. And working with the FBI, uh, who will have the lead on this is in crisis management, and of course FEMA has a consequence management, and I'm sure Director Albo and uh, all the staff there are liaisoning with the FBI at this time. Uh, was that something that you prepared on your own, or did you do that in close coordination and get regular updates from the FBI? We uh, worked very closely with the FBI, and, and if there was a threat, uh, then the, they would uh, notify us and work very closely with them, and as, even for as far as having someone in their operations center. When you look at those pictures of what happened in lower Manhattan in the canyons of this great city with those two 110-story buildings coming down, you can only imagine what the carnage must be on the ground. It, it's, it's probably horrifying, and uh, I saw earlier said it looked like a war zone, and I'm sure it does, and just looking at the pictures, but, you know, there's so many firefighters and police officers that were probably up at the base of that building, probably in that building, trying to get people out, and I'm sure that, uh, you know, the loss is going to be tremendous, and the uh, pain is going to be felt for a long, long time. Jimmy Lee Witt, thank you very much. Uh, by the way, Afghanistan's ruling Taliban movement on Tuesday said that uh, Osama bin Laden, uh, they are closely allied with him, was not responsible for the attacks on the United States. What happened in the United States, according to the Taliban, was not a job of ordinary people. It could have been the work of governments. Osama bin Laden cannot do this kind of work. Neither can we, a Taliban spokesman said uh, from the southern city of Kandahar. The uh, Taliban, of course, a very militant and very conservative uh, Islamic organization and widely believed to be harboring Osama bin Laden, a very wealthy Saudi dissident who has a very sophisticated apparatus uh, at his disposal. Uh, he has not been seen for some time, although he does appear from uh, time to time on some Islamic uh, media outlets. Uh, one. A reporter who has been in touch with him said that three weeks ago he said uh, an attack was planned on the United States, but that, of course, has not yet been uh, verified. He is, at the moment, I think fair to say, at the top of everyone's list of suspects. But as we have learned on these occasions in times past, uh, it's often not the best thing to do to make a premature judgment. There is the picture that we have often seen of him as he has declared a holy war against the United States. Let's go to General Norman Schwarzkopf now, who had the Southern Command and, of course, commanded the forces during the uh, Persian Gulf War. General Schwarzkopf, I've been trying to review in my own mind the incidents in which the United States has been a conspicuous participant or absent in the past month or so. We lost a spy plane over southern Iraq. We've stepped up pressure on southern Iraq. Obviously, in the Middle East, in the, the, in the ongoing dispute between the Palestinians and the Israelis, there's a great feeling that the United States is siding only with the Israelis. The war in Sudan goes on, but we've not taken an active role there. Are there any other signs on your radar screen that would indicate uh, that this kind of thing was likely to happen? Well, you know, Tom, the truth of the matter is that most of the Middle East countries consider the United States to be, you know, the, 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 uh, the main source of support for, for Israel. It isn't, it isn't isolated just in certain states. And, uh, you know, any one of those people, if you got them aside and asked them truthfully, they would tell you that they were not in favor of our policies with regard to Israel. So do you think that that probably was the cause of all this, this uh, continual escalation that has been going on between Palestine and Israel? And there's been an absence of participation, I think, that it's fair to say, in the part of this administration and all that. Well, I, I, you know, I, I think that's kind of speculation at this time. I certainly think that that, uh, you know, the reason why the United States is hated in so many places in the Middle East is with regard to the support of the state of Israel. And as a matter of fact, they'll openly state that if Israel had not had the support of the United States, it wouldn't exist today. So they go so far as to say that. There are people, many, many people still trapped. When uh, you and I were talking earlier, we were commenting on uh, the sophistication uh, of this attack and the complexity of that. Doesn't that stun you some? It, it really does. I mean, just, just what was mentioned by, you know, uh, by, by Robert Hager, the fact that uh, undoubtedly, uh, you know, I can't see any uh, U.S. commercial airline pilot flying their plane directly into an obstacle like that. Undoubtedly, there was, uh, you know, somebody at the controls that was able to guide the plane there. That, that in itself is kind of scary. 
I told you earlier about the fact that it bothers me that with all the devices we have against hijackers, that, that, that hijacking can still take place on this scale and, and, and organized in that fashion. Uh, that causes me concern. I certainly agree with what Senator McCain said about the fact that, you know, many, many years ago, uh, we abandoned human intelligence. Uh, uh, the attitude was that only bad guys have spies, and, and good guys don't need spies, and we put satellites in the air, and we put a huge amount of investment into technical intelligence. At the same time, we dismantled human intelligence. I don't know what the status of that is today, but, but, uh, but uh, we damn sure need to get somebody inside these organizations uh, I, I would tell you that... General, I'm just going to interrupt you for a moment because we're looking at some scenes that we have not yet uh, had an opportunity to see. It does look like a nuclear winter in lower Manhattan. It is one of the most vital areas anywhere in the world, obviously. The home of the financial markets, the World Trade Center, lots of residences. Uh, there's been a real revival down there in recent years. And it has a great gray pall of dust and smoke and debris and, of course, overlaying all that is the psychological effect of knowing that there could be a casualty list in terms of fatalities that could go into the thousands. Yeah. I mean, Pearl Harbor, we lost 2,400. And, uh, you know, when you hear the numbers today, it's hard to believe that we're not going to greatly exceed that number. And as I pointed out earlier, in Pearl Harbor, it was a military attacking a military installation. Um, this was the use of innocent people in uh, commercial airliners to attack other innocent people in New York. Uh, there was one military target, obviously the Pentagon. You can see, if you're sharing, if you're looking at this with me, General, the extent of the damage in Lower Manhattan. Yeah, unbelievable, unbelievable. And and it, and you know, it's the natural inclination is okay. We got to hit somebody back. And and in this case, what's going to you know be even more frustration to the national psyche is 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 you can't hit back, you know, you don't, who, who you're going to hit at this stage of the game. Yeah. Thank you very much, General Norman Schwarzkopf. We'll ask you to stand by. We'll be coming back to you. Uh, this is uh, as effective as a bomb being dropped there. There were two bombs in effect. Commercial airliners flown into those two buildings and they came down. We presume because of the initial explosion, there may have been secondary explosions as well that were detonated in the building by these terrorists. Robert Harper was one of those who was uh, in the area when all of this occurred, Mr. Harper? Yes, Tom, how are you today? Well, tell me where you were when uh, the first plane flew into the first building. Um, I was down below the World Trade Centers. Um, I was uh, arriving at work just a little late, and um, we could, uh, the bomb, the, the first plane had crashed into the building, so there were many people, you know, sort of standing around. There were EM, EMS uh, workers running around as well, and you could see the second plane coming around and everyone sort of pointing up, and then that second plane just crashed into the building. And what about to people who were trying to get out of the building? We had one report of bodies falling through the air and people jumping from windows. Did you see any of that? Absolutely, absolutely. It was a very traumatic day, I think, um, having seen that, because where the initial explosion was, there was a lot of black smoke coming um, out of around, I believe it was around the 78th floor, and you saw people jumping for their lives um, out of the 78th floor of the World Trade Center. Um, smoke everywhere, fire everywhere, and people were continuing to, to jump out of the 78th floor, floor, so people began to run away because once the second explosion happened, um, the debris uh, that was caused by that began to fall everywhere, and everybody just started running toward the mayor's office, and I began to run toward the Woolworth building, which was close to that, and then as I got closer to that, I realized if, you know, the top of the World Trade Center hit the Woolworth building, that building, too, would be affected and it might also fall down. Did you have a sense right away that uh, these buildings could come down? Um, not initially. For about 15 minutes or so, people only thought, you know, they couldn't really tell what had happened. And only after the second plane hit did people realize that, you know, this is probably something that was orchestrated. Uh, and so then people initially who had, you know, been trying to go back to the scene and try to help people realized that another plane had hit the building. And that's when people said, look, this can't have been a mistake. Uh, where are you now? Um, I'm outside of the emergency room at Presbyterian Hospital. Um, I've just been released uh, for uh, smoke inhalation. I've been in the hospital there. They rushed me to the hospital um, you know, not too long after that because the black soot and everything that was associated with the building, I mean, heavy black smoke engulfed the entire financial district. Um, 
you know, any from nine o'clock onward, and um, we, we were so- sitting on the side of the road. EMS workers were there um, administering um, oxygen to people, thinking that everything was okay. And then, as they began to realize that the explosion might have caused so much trauma to both the World Trade Center that they would fall, then everybody just began to run, be- began to run because they they saw that the the building itself was actually going to fall. So all of the people that had gone to help out were then put in you know double danger because you were then running and the building literally we came and fell you know in over the entire like financial district area there was a complete nightmare black smoke everywhere people were running toward the brooklyn bridge running you know away from the mayor's office afraid that the, the falling part of the world trade center would hit other buildings and that would you know cause a topple effect thank you very much mr harper and uh uh, thank God you're okay, and I hope that uh, you'll be able to deal with all of this. We do appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's been a real mess, you know, and I can't, I, coming back in the ambulance, you know, somebody said, you know, one of the things that they remembered, you know, thinking about is the date today is September 11th, so 9 So, you know, it's something that can't really go without notice, is that this was completely planned, completely orchestrated. You know, whoever did this um, has been planning this, obviously, for a very long time. Thank you uh, very much, Robert Harper, who was one of the survivors who was uh, just a little bit late to work this morning but then got caught and the uh, devastating attack on the Twin Trade Towers. Uh, they, it's, a, it's hard to, uh, for me to overstate to people who are unfamiliar with New York just how dynamic that area is in terms of people coming and going. The two t- uh, towers are 110 stories high, or they were. Uh, 20 to 50,000 people would work in them at any one time. It's uh, just a few blocks from the uh, stock market and from many of the principal banks in America to say nothing of residential areas. And we will not know for some time what the death toll is there, to say nothing of the number of people who have been injured, so many of them, with burns. Let's go to Washington now and NBC's Washington Bureau Chief, Tim Russert. Tim, uh, give us the state of play in the nation's capital right now. We know that the White House and the State Department and CIA have been evacuated. Dennis Hastert has been removed. Where is Dick Cheney at this hour? Do we know? Tom, he is in a secure location. They won't tell us exactly, but I do know that he is there with his top-level aides. Uh, we have heard from some of those people. Uh, he has been in constant communication with the President of the United States and the National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice. Tom, I've been speaking to people in the intelligence and law enforcement community in and out, those who have served, those who are serving now. No one is the least bit surprised that there was a terrorist attack on the shores of America. Every person, to a man and woman, absolutely stunned, not only by the magnitude, but by the precision of this attack. Uh, They are absolutely convinced that there's only a few cells that could possibly have done this. And this is quite interesting because I didn't realize it until it was pointed out to me. Every one of the four hijacked planes that Bob Hager talked to you about was bound for California. In the words of this high-ranking official, the bastards knew they all had a plane full of fuel for the maximum impact upon collision. There is in my experience in Washington, unprecedented anger here, but no one knows how or where to channel it. Right now, the situation is a bit chaotic. Communication is difficult, but the Bush administration is underscoring that the president is in charge, in command, in constant communication, and will bring these people to justice. They just know it's going to take a long, long time. Tim, it's also going to be a test of the political maturity, if you will, of Washington. It's a city that has been so riven by what many would describe as petty political disputes, but this is one nation on this day. Suddenly the Social Security lockbox seems so trivial, Tom. One official said to me, Tim, your life is going to change, but more important, your son's life is going to change forever. America will never be the same after September 11, 2001. The levels of security, heightened tension, uh, the way we look at each other and look at our institutions, Uh, will in fact be altered. Uh, That will bring uh, some gratitude, if you will, to the terrorist. And that's why we as a nation, Democrats, Republicans, Independents, are, as they talk with one another today, are absolutely unified in their attempt to strike back, but also try to put salve on the national psyche so we don't become an armed camp resisting an enemy we really can't identify and never know when it's striking. Because the consequences psychologically for this country are every bit as great as they are physically for America as well. It is worth pointing out, I suppose, that we all breathed a great sigh of relief when the Cold War came to an end with the collapse of communism. 
and yet there was nothing as devastating as this for this country during that long, cold twilight that we faced down communism in Moscow with its considerable nuclear arsenal, which it still has in place, obviously. You know, Tom, it's a very important point because all during this past few weeks, the debate about missile defense systems, uh, many people were saying publicly, even those proponents or the detractors, well, you know, we're a long way from research on this, but there is a potential threat of a rogue nation launching a missile or an accidental launch from Russia or China modernizing, modernizing force, modernizing their force. But, but everyone kept saying the true risk, the real risk is terrorist attack. And we plain don't know how to defend ourselves. But again, and let me underscore this, people are absolutely stunned, disbelieving that something so well coordinated, something is with a tick-tock like this, four hijackings within a matter of an hour, and then being able to take those very planes and drive them into the World Trade Center and the Pentagon, and there is growing suspicion, Tom, here, that the plane that landed, it crashed in Pennsylvania, was most likely headed for the Capitol or White House. That's the operating theory of many of the people I've spoken to today. Thank you very much, uh, NBC's Tim Russert. Uh, the equation has changed for all of us personally and professionally in the course of the last several hours, and we'll be dealing with this for a, a long, long time. But first, we want to take you through the eyewitness accounts of people who were witness to what happened here on a very sunny early fall morning in New York today. Some of the eyewitnesses. It's about the year in combat. I never saw anything like this. Before a lot of people died, nothing is devastating. We carried a bunch of people that we found lying in the debris. It was complete darkness. We stumbled over some people, we picked them up and carried them across the street. You could hear the rumbling when you looked up, you could see the top of the building just crumbling. Then there was a haunting story from an eyewitness that we heard from a few moments ago of people in wheelchairs who were unable to get out of the building as he ran down the stairs and he was obviously overcome with emotion as he described that for us. Uh, we don't have any numbers for you. Uh, we're trying to be as circumspect as we can be. All public officials are saying that they expect the final death toll to be horrendous. But this business of determining how many people are still in the rubble will take many, many hours, if not days, to determine. Here is a quick summary of what we have been through today in this country on the 11th of September, the year 2001. At 8.42 this morning, first one plane that had been hijacked crashed into the World Trade Center. Then, not too long after that, a second plane. About an hour later, the Pentagon was attacked by a hijacked airliner, and then came word that another hijacked airliner had crashed outside of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Uh, when we saw the first reports and witnessed, those of us who live in New York, of the World Trade Center being a hit by an airplane, at first all of us thought, I'm sure, that it had to be some kind of a terrible accident. And then when we heard that a second plane, and you can see it flown deliberately into the uh, World Trade Center, the horror of this terrorist war began to unfold and it continues to unfold here uh, now almost five hours later. And we'll be continuing to cover this uh, across America and in the nation's capital. NBC's Pat Dawson has been not too far from the World Trade Center throughout most of the day where it has been chaotic and terrifying. Pat? Tom, as you uh, point out, we try not to exaggerate uh, very much in this circumstance, and yet in many ways it's hard not to exaggerate just the things we have been seen and the things that we have been told. Uh, I think it is fair to say that the task that now confronts rescue workers here is Herculean, a very, very difficult task, and it is of two parts. It has been about three hours since what we might call the last catastrophic incident in a morning of catastrophes. Uh, that is since the North Tower of the World Trade Center, which used to stand behind me just about 10 blocks south Right below there, it used to tower above the buildings, which you can see, and obviously it is no longer there, nor is the South Tower. Three and a half hours since that happened, there have been no catastrophic incidents since then, but it has affected the rescue effort clearly because they are afraid of what could happen, what still might happen, since there were a sequence of 
catastrophes, if you will. That has made the rescue very, very difficult. At this point, we are being told unofficially that there may be as many as two to three hundred rescue workers who are actually down there. We have seen pictures of some of them. They are down around the base of this building. They are beginning the, again to use that word, Herculean task of trying to find the people who might be alive in that debris. We know that there are a great number of people who are dead in there. Unquestionably, what they are hoping to find is survivors. And at this point, they really can't speculate on how many there are, how many there could be. And I don't think it really serves us at this point to speculate on the numbers that it could be. Uh, one of the tasks, though, is to try to get this rescue effort in its entirety going. And as you can see behind me down here, there are probably hundreds of New York City uh, and New York State and federal rescue people who are involved, fire, police, emergency service, quite a few. In addition to those, the task is, uh, is certainly aided by the American Red Cross's disaster relief teams. They are here on the scene. This is Frank Donahue, who is with the American uh, Red Cross. Uh, Frank, tell me first of all, as you start out here, what is it you're trying to do? Well, our immediate, our immediate uh, purpose is to kind of assess what role the Red Cross can play initially, and certainly it's to help the emergency medical people that are here provide any kind of relief and support we can for them. People being evacuated from neighborhoods need a place to go, and the Red Cross is setting up service centers and shelters. There's one at Grand Central Station and Penn Station. Um, and then the blood supply, making sure we have a safe blood supply, not only here but throughout the country. Do you have any idea, have you heard, how many casualties have been dealt with so far? No, I have not. I'm sorry. I have not heard that. Is it, it, now, part of your task, though, is also to provide blood supplies. Obviously, that will be needed in Houston. Absolutely. Houston. And people throughout the country are responding. They should call 1-800-GIVE-LIFE. It's important to note that this incident, and, and you know, there's blood needed here in Altoona, there's blood needed all throughout the country that's been affected by this disaster. Mm -hmm. Another part is people that are, are, tra are moving around, are, are traveling today, no airport in this country is open. And so Red Cross volunteers are in every airport providing assistance to families. Families are calling the Red Cross here in New York as they are calling their local Red Cross to try to communicate and find the well-being of people that were in this building as well as people. Um, in the other affected areas. So you were also telling me about grief counseling uh, and, and dealing with people who've been traumatized around the country, maybe at other airports. Absolutely. Boston, for example, LAX, where those airplanes were uh, coming from and headed to, we have Red Cross mental health worker volunteers there that are providing assistance to families. Um, and again, that's happening throughout the country where people have been affected by this disaster. Uh, here in New York alone, the Greater New York Red Cross has had lots of experience at the World Trade Center a number of years ago. Today, there's about 1,200 local Red Cross volunteers here in New York providing food and shelter direction and support to people that are incredibly affected by this incident. And how many Red Cross workers do you think around the country? Oh, a number of thousand, a couple thousand for sure. I know in Philadelphia where I came from, we're on standby working with emergency management. It's the same thing in every major metropolitan area that Red Cross workers okay. work closely with emergency management. Frank, I thank you so much for Thanks taking some time out. We appreciate it. That was Frank Donahue, the American Red Cross. Tom, that brings you uh, pretty much as much information as we have here in what remains a fairly chaotic situation. Tom? All right, thanks very much, uh, NBC's thanks. Pat Dawson. As the uh, shock begins to wear down, we're going to all, all of us are going to be have our patients tested as well as we await uh, these reports. We'll try to deal with it as factually as we possibly can. It does now appear that the wave of attacks is over. We could not be certain of that just a few hours ago as there were these reports of planes that were still in the air, some that had been hijacked, and their destinations were uncertain at, at that time. This is a live picture of Lower Manhattan, missing one of its, two of its most familiar profiles, obviously. The twin trade towers of the World Trade Center, uh, iconic buildings here in New York, uh, really representing, symbolic, if you will, of the enormous economic strength of this country. Uh, they sustained an attack in 1993. They were reopened. The country came back from that. And we went about uh, our merry way again, thinking that in Fortress America, this couldn't possibly happen, but of course it has. Neil Livingston is uh, one of the most widely recognized on experts on international terrorism. Mr. Livingston, we keep coming back to the same issue. This was a very sophisticated attack. This was not just a lone suicide bomber of some kind. Four hijacking simultaneously. Obviously someone in the cockpit who knew how to get the plane to the targets that they wanted to get them to and it hap had had to have happened over a long period of time and they were all transcontinental flights loaded with fuel. Tom, this is our worst case nightmare scenario, the one that we've hoped would never happen, and that would be a, 
a multiplicity of targets with a multiplicity of uh, uh, highly sophisticated bombs, uh, in this case aircraft, uh, and, and um, very symbolic targets. And so this, a uh, great deal of thought went into this, a great deal of time and money. Uh, this kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so we can... America that have been growing. Is that true? Well, there clearly are a number of people in the United States that have been the beneficiaries of our of our uh, relatively liberal immigration policy that have hidden within various communities here and uh, have very uh, expressed very strong anti-American sentiments. Whether that can be translated into terrorism at this point is is uh, is open to question. I would suspect that what we will see in this case are are perhaps foreign nationals who have arrived in the United States strictly to carry out this mission, hijack these aircrafts and take them to their uh, to their targets. Uh, very similar to what we saw in that millennial uh, potential attack when uh, when a man was arrested at uh, the border in Washington State who was going to carry out bombing attacks in the United States. He was an outsider who had been sent here to do that. All right, Neil Livingston, thank you very much. I also have on the phone now uh, Anthony Lake, Tony Lake, a former National Security Advisor to President Clinton, who has been a longtime student of the prospect of terrorism in this country, recently wrote a riveting fictional account of the various scenarios that the United States may have to deal with. But even in your most wildest imaginative days, Tony, you could not have anticipated something like this. No, it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, it's hard to say you can be lucky in any respect in something in, in such a catastrophe. But one of the great dangers still lurking out there is that it could have involved some kind of weapon of mass destruction. But at the same time, uh, it's hard to understate the amount of damage that has been done here physically and certainly in terms of loss of life. When oh, you have an institution like the Pentagon attack, the World Trade Center is attacked, and the plane that went to Pittsburgh might have been headed for the Capitol or the White House, for God's yes. sake. No, this is terrible. A, a, as I said, a catastrophe. Clearly a very sophisticated terrorist attack. Uh, the, our intelligence community has headed off some in the past year or two. Uh, their ability to evade our usual intelligence gathering methods in order to pull this off is extraordinary. And, and one question now we need to focus on is not only why did this happen, but where do we go from here? Well, short term, if you were the National Security Advisor now back in your old office in the White House, what would be your recommendations in terms of a suppression of some of our normal liberties that we have in this country? Well, we mustn't defeat our liberties in their, uh, in trying to defend them. I think what I would be uh, urging now is, first of all, of course, uh, get all the information we can immediately while dealing with the uh, human dimensions of this catastrophe. And then thinking ahead, uh, I think there are three fronts we have to act on. One, there must be, once we have identified the source of this, we must, there must be an American uh, response to this of some kind. And once again, we are going to interrupt the NBC News special coverage of the tragedy in Lower Manhattan today to bring you what we know about the situation here in our area. Again, rescue workers continue to be on the scene trying to determine if there are people trapped still inside those buildings. We have absolutely no word on the number of casualties. We can only imagine what it went out to be. I can only imagine what uh, yeah, our hearts have to go out, certainly to those people who, who don't know, who have relatives and friends and, uh, and acquaintances down there in the World Trade Center area and other areas in this country that have been hit by this. I was I just arrived here uh, about an hour ago and have been watching the coverage. Uh, I understand that we have Mayor Giuliani, we'll get to him in just a second here, but uh, I had to drive in. It was difficult getting in uh, from Connecticut and uh, from a slightly different perspective. <clears throat> Coming in, you could see the plume of smoke from Westchester County in That's the World amazing. Trade Center. And it was, a, it was just a startling thought that this, uh, this smear on the landscape, this uh, symbol of, uh, of terror and an assault in our country could be seen from so far away. And um, as I came down approaching Midtown, uh, traffic was stopped, a blood van went through, uh, trying to head down to the area where it was needed most. Of course, and uh, we do need blood donations desperately. We've had calls from all of the hospitals asking for help. And of course, if you're nearby and able to get to them, please do go donate blood. But uh, Chuck, mm -hmm. 
uh, again, we're, we're, ta we're taking a look now at the towers collapsing, but you're a pilot, mm -hmm. and eyewitnesses initially began to tell us about the size and the scope of the airplanes that they saw making a beeline towards these towers. And at that point, we uh, you know, couldn't, couldn't imagine that there would be a pilot that would actually be doing that. Now, we know now that these are two United States aircraft. The pilots obviously were, the regular pilots were obviously not at the controls at that point. One would assume that, that um, the whoever took command of the planes also took control of the planes with some basic knowledge of aviation. Uh, what I will tell you is that as you look at that cascading wreckage of the collapse of the World Trade Center, that somewhere in that wreckage are two cockpit voice recorders and two flight data recorders. And they may be the most vital clues in this investigation because whatever was said in that cockpit for the last 45 minutes of the flight is going to be recorded and retained. Those things are designed to withstand crashes. And odds are they'll be found by investigators and clues will be in that tape, particularly the cockpit voice recorder. There's no mystery about the flight. Mm -hmm. We know exactly what happens. So right. the flight data recorder will only confirm what we saw with our own eyes. But the cockpit voice recorder will have in it, unless these guys were sophisticated enough, to disable it? To pull the circuit breakers and the cockpit voice recorders. But they may have wanted to leave a message. So I would, I would say, um, as we think about, along two tracks here, we're thinking, of course, about trying to rescue the people who are still alive, trying to um, save as many lives as possible from this terrible attack on our country. The other line of thought is, who did it and what do we do? This is a whole new chapter in a war of terror on this planet. And... Uh, I think that certainly those uh, those voice recorders are going to be um, a very high priority item for the, any investigators. There was also some speculation, I should caution, from uh, an author who has, had, uh, has followed terrorist acts very closely and has done a lot of reporting and writing about them, and she suggested that this was geared for maximum media attention. Well, certainly, and, and if that's the intention it generally is in acts of terror, um, it worked. We uh, have no choice but to cover this hideous tragedy. And uh, certainly the sequencing of the planes into the World Trade Center when all attention was fixed on the first impact to see the second plane strike um, as dramatically as it did. Um, well, you couldn't have, if you were planning it as a terrorist, you couldn't have planned it better. In fact, the, the nation's air system right now is, is basically paralyzed, shut down. Mm -hmm. So there are a lot of people outside of New York who are affected by this tragedy because they will not be getting to where they wanted to go right now as we look once again at this amazing home video shot in fact by a Dateline producer as the World Trade Center tower collapsed right in front of his eyes. He's lucky to have survived that. Well his description of what he did, he uh, ran along with some police officers who were right by him, they ran, they turned a corner became black as night, and he dove underneath the car, and that is the only thing that saved him. Omar Walsas with us here. He was actually in the area um, and um, and felt the explosion. And you, this I, I see, uh, this this had a rather profound effect on you, Omar. You saw yeah, firsthand, I, up close, exactly what happened and, and how terrifying that explosion was and the collapse. I was in the area, and before the buildings collapsed, there were lots of people standing around basically looking at the explosion, and we were sort of talking to each other, amazed that it, it hadn't collapsed, and then all of a sudden there was this thunderous crack, and you saw the building start to, you know, sort of move, and everybody just in this sort of riotous tumble began pouring down the street, you, the, the, like something out of a movie. There was this billowing cloud of smoke. I was scared that a building would topple and then a domino effect crush us darted into a lobby and uh, and then just you know it, it sort of out, the outside became nighttime you were actually at one point out running the smoke behind you were trying to outrun weren't yeah, exactly you? and that it, it was it was it was quite scary because there were there were, uh, there were all these people who had been watching now sort of trying to run away and so people were uh, stumbling over each other and 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 you could look behind you and see I mean I I was convinced that one of the buildings was tumbling in part because there was smoke billowing out of it and and so not just the World Trade Center but buildings around it and uh, and then and it, yeah it was it was quite frightening and as I understand it you actually there, there was somebody who was injured and you then carried them someplace to get them treatment. Well, the, the, the people who were in the, the, the sort of the doorman of the building were, were quite professional. They put us in the basement and while we were in the basement uh, I noticed a gentleman was bleeding on from his ankle and me and another fellow carried him out of the building. When we got outside it was as if it were nighttime 
um, and and you know you could you were breathing all of this dust and smoke, and we we sort of carried him uh, to a Duane Reed where they offered us some stuff, and then and then finally got him to a nurse far away. But it was uh, quite terrifying, not only because you couldn't see very well, but because there was the sound of the airplanes coming overhead. And of course, when you hear the airplane, you think it's another terrorist attack. Mm. And then there would be more sort of wild cracking sounds, and and so every now and then everybody would start to charge down the street, fearing that another building was collapsing. We know the World Trade Center towers are gone, which is difficult to believe. But what did you see, Omar, in terms of other damage to other nearby buildings in this very tightly packed part of Manhattan? Well, when, when we were, I mean, when I first got down there, all you saw were sort of scattered papers and the kind of fire and smoke coming out of the building. And so it seemed like it was going to be contained to that. When, when we got out, it was just, it was so dark, so dusty, you couldn't see anything. I mean, you were, you were, you know, you were happy to see 20 feet in front of you. As we've been uh, watching all of these scenes, there have been many instances of, of, of certainly heroic efforts, not, not only by the policemen and the firefighters, but certainly by passers-by in the street just simply trying to help one another to escape this horrid situation. That was actually one of the inspiring things, was that, that people were making water available, people were, were really trying to be helpful, and so there, there was a kind of civic response that was, uh, mod was inspiring. Um. We said a moment ago that Mayor Giuliani has made a more recent statement. We've heard from him a couple of times informally, but now I think we have some videotape of the mayor commenting on today's tragedy. I would, uh, first of all, once again remind everyone to uh, evacuate lower Manhattan. I mean, further away from lower Manhattan you can get. Uh, the safer it's going to be for you with regard to the smoke and the easier it's going to be for the police and the fire and everyone else to evacuate the people that need to be evacuated. We're going to, uh, we're going to uh, try to get as many emergency personnel down there as possible. We've communicated with the governor, the National Guard will assist us later in the day. We've communicated with the White House and the urban search and rescue team will be here later to help, help us and assist us. And uh, the government is doing everything they can to secure the airspace around uh, around the city of New York. At this point, I don't know the, the reason for this. I don't have any more insight into this than anyone else does other than the two planes that attacked the World Trade Center. Tremendous damage has been done to both buildings. I don't even uh, have a guess at the amount of damage in terms of the loss of human life. And this, this is a horrible, horrible, awful day. Our focus now has to be on, on trying to evacuate as many people as possible, save as many lives as we, as we possibly can, and uh, make the city as secure as possible. The subways are running in the rest of the city. Lexington Avenue starting to run again, so people need to use the subway to get, get out of lower Manhattan. They'll be able to use the subway. And uh, we need people out of there so that the rescue efforts can go on all during the, uh, the afternoon. I suspect they'll be going on through the night. And we'll, we'll be getting relief from the National Guard and the federal government later, later today. Mr. Mayor, any indication on the ballpark number? Uh, I don't, I, I, do, I do not want to, I, do, I don't want to, I, obviously there are all kinds of numbers that are swimming in my head as to what the numbers must be, but I don't know, I have no idea what the numbers are. It's, horrible. I think any of you that saw this have probably never seen anything like this before. The people jumping out of the building and uh, it's a horrible, horrible thing to see. In terms of the police mobilization, uh, maybe the commission can tell us how, uh, what's going on downtown. Have you brought in uh, additional uh, cops, presumably from all over? There's additional resources coming from all over the city. We've activated both duty MOS to come in. Uh, we're getting the assistance of New Jersey and the outlying, uh, outer line counties. 